All right. Habari gani, karibuni. I had started it, but I hadn't started it. So here we are. It's Monday morning. I hope you're all doing well. Um, once again, we're going to jump into the uh, reading of um, Baba Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped um, Africa. This book was first written, um, Baba Walter Rodney wrote this book in 1972. Um, and I believe the republishing of this one was 2018. Um, this is the new one. This new one, as you all heard last week from our reading, <clears throat> has a forward by Angela Davis, um, uh, and then the introduction, and there's much more in the back when we get to it. Uh, the first reading that we had of, of how Europe underdeveloped Africa was when I read uh, the postscript by Abdul Rahman Mohamed Babu, um, who is an economist and an activist uh, in Zanzibar, who was arrested and, and I think jailed for uh, doing the same thing that we're all doing, right? Asking for black people to be treated well um, and for the wrong that has been done to us to be corrected. So I'm gonna give it a few minutes um, as we wait just a few minutes, maybe five minutes, in case we have people who want to um, be in the live and they are still getting here. So um, we can start sharing in the chat. What did you like about last week's reading? What are you looking forward to in this week's reading? What questions do you have? Um, do you think uh, Baba Rodney was on point with, with his observations? Um, do you think we need to heed his warnings and, and take action as he tells us? Um, and as I say that, I'm reminded, um, this is another book that I encourage you all to, to grab. There's, there are many other books of Baba Rodney's and we'll continue to um, share them. This is another one. Um, I actually reread this for the second time um, because I was writing a review on it, but it's just um, the lessons here. When he speaks of grounding himself with his brothers, he's talking about the Rastafarians in Jamaica, who, uh, for those of you who know that history, have been um, villainized for years by Jamaican government and, and unfortunately, the Christian Jamaican population, right? Um, I kind of got a, a hint of that growing up in Kenya because we had Kenyans who, uh, I had cousins who were trying to follow the Rastafarian movement, getting the dreadlocks, listening to the music. I remember hanging out with one cousin who was doing that and enjoying the music, but you were deemed as a, um, a troubled child if you are doing that, right? And that comes from the culture there where Rastafarians are, were deemed as like just problematic um, and they were villainized. So he does not follow that trend that is clearly coming from imperialism and colonialism to villainize a people who are grounded in their black consciousness and he grounds himself with them. Uh, Baba Rodney says he learns a lot from that experience. Not only was he teaching them, but he was learning from them. And for us, the message there is that we must <clears throat> interact with the masses because um, we who have gone to school uh, in the Western way, whether you're in Africa or outside Africa, um, have been, uh, we are the intellectuals, right? And we distance ourselves from the masses uh, back at home and even in the diaspora. <clears throat> and that's wrong because that is why a lot of us intellectuals, uh, a lot of intellectuals end up thinking that there's nothing to be fixed because you're living comfortable lives, right? Baba Rodney says they reward you with a car, uh, a picket fence, a, ho a house, a mansion, and you think that everything is fine because you're distancing yourself from where the trouble is. Um, and that's not good. So we must ground ourselves with our brothers. All right, I'm going to start reading because we are at 8.05. Um, just bear with me. <clears throat> so we are on chapter two today, and um, this is how Africa developed before the coming of the Europeans up to the 15th century. Before even the British came into relations with our people, we were a developed people, having our own institutions, having our own ideas of government. That's a quote 
uh, from J.E. Casely Hayford, African uh, Gold Coast Nationalist, 1922. Baba Rodney starts a general ov overview. It has been shown that using comparative standards, Africa today is underdeveloped in relation to Western Europe and a few other parts of the world, and that the present position has been arrived at not by the separate evolution of Africa on the one hand and Europe on the other, but through exploitation. He's very clear to make that point. The only reason you're looking is at Africa as underdeveloped is because you're measuring it by Western European standards, right? And he's saying that the only reason Africa is underdeveloped is because of exploitation, but that very entity that you're using to measure it by. As is well known, Africa has had prolonged and extensive contact with Europe. And one has to bear in mind that contact between different societies changes their respective rates of development. To set the record straight, four operations are required. One, reconstruction of the nature of development in Africa before the coming of Europeans. Two, reconstruction of the nature of development which took place in Europe before expansion abroad. Three, analysis of Africa's contribution to Europe's present developed state. And four, analysis of Europe's contribution to Africa's present underdeveloped state. Now, in all my being in spaces with Africans who are trying to find solutions for the problem, the, situ the current state of Africa, and in all my debating and arguing and, and, and sharing observations, I haven't heard it explained as simply as that. And I would urge those of us who are getting in rooms to discuss what the problems are and what the solutions are to make it that simple. Baba Rodney says, to set the record straight, four operations are required. In other words, if you're going to be sitting in a room to find solutions for Africa, this is a, a place to start, right? First, reconstruct the nature of development in Africa before the coming of Europeans. In other words, go back and see what the nature of development in Africa was before the coming of Europeans. We are reconstructing it because we have mis mis we have been miseducated, which is why we are reconstructing. So the education, the miseducation that has been put in our minds, we're going to erase it and put back what actually happened, what the nature of development in Africa before the coming of Europeans was. How were Africans developing before the invasion of Europeans in Africa? Two, recon reconstruction of the nature of development which took place in Europe before expansion abroad, right? Look at how Europe was developing or not developing before they expanded abroad. Three, analysis of Africa's contribution. And I'll say on that number two, we all, those of us who are, let me not say we all because not all of us do. At one point, I, I didn't have that information. Um, Europe, after World War II, and that by then they're already in Africa, but think about World War II, the economies are falling apart, right? And that's when they intensify the, the, the structures, the monetary uh, structures, the, of the UN and all that, that is going to now like just ground itself in the exploitation of Africa. They're doing that because they are not developing, because they are, they are risking falling apart. And so they have found out that there's a place where there are resources and that's where they go in. So if we're going to go back to that, which is reconstruct, you will see that at one point Europe was very desperate and not developed and they reach out to Africa to help that. This is what Baba Rodney is telling us. To do that helps you understand how they are the ones who have underdeveloped Africa. Three, analysis of Africa's contribution to Europe's present developed state. That exactly is what we're saying. How did Europe develop before expanding abroad? How is Europe now developed after expanding abroad? Then analysis of Europe's contribution to Africa's present and a developed state. Through that developing after expanding abroad, that is the result of expanding abroad. How did that expansion of Europe underdevelop Africa? The second task has already been extensively carried out in European literature and only passing references need to be made. 
but the others are all deserving of further attention. The African continent reveals very fully the workings of the law of uneven development of societies. There are marked contrasts between the Ethiopian empire and the hunting groups of pygmies in the Congo forest, or between the empires of the Western Sudan and the Khoisan hunter-gatherers of the Kalahari desert. Indeed, there were striking contrasts within any given geographical area. The Ethiopian empire embraced literate, feudal, Amharic noblemen, as well as simple, Kaffa cultivators and Gala pastoralists. The empires of the Western Sudan had sophisticated, educated Mandinga townsmen, small communities of Bozo fishermen, and nomadic Fulani herdsmen. Even among clans and lineages that appear roughly similar, there were consid considerable differences. However, it is possible to distinguish between what was uniquely African and what was universal in the sense of being characteristic of all human societies at a given stage of development. It is also essential to recognize the process of dialectical evolution from lower to higher forms of social organization. And in looking at the most advanced social formations, one would appreciate the potential of the continental as a as, of the continent as a whole and the direction of change. I'll repeat that one more time. It is also essential to recognize the process of dialectical evolution from lower to higher forms of social organization. And in looking at the most advanced social formations, one would appreciate the potential of the continent as a whole and the direction of change. The moment that the topic of the pro-European African past is raised, many individuals are concerned for various reasons to know about the existence of African civilizations. Mainly, this stems from a desire to make comparisons with European civilizations. This is not the context in which to evaluate the so-called civilizations of Europe. It is enough to note the behavior of European capitalists from the ep epoch of slavery through colonialism, fascism, and genocidal wars in Asia and Africa. Such barbarism causes suspicion to attach to the use of the word civilization to describe Western Europe and North America. As far as Africa is concerned, during the period of early development, it is preferable to speak in terms of cultures rather than civilizations. A culture is a total way of life. It embraces what people ate and what they wore, the way they walked and the way they talked, the manner in which they treated death and greeted the newborn. Obviously, Unique features came into existence in virtually every locality with regard to all social details. In addition, the continent of Africa south of the Great Sahara Desert formed a broad community where resemblances were clearly discernible. For example, music and dance had key roles in uncontaminated African society. He's calling it uncontaminated. They were ever present at birth, initiation, marriage, death, as well at, as at times of recreation. I remember, um, I'll pause there quickly, uh, at one of my families here in the States, um, one of my family's funerals, um, we were singing, the Kenyans, the Kenyan side of the family was singing, those who grew up in Kenya. And the uh, American side of the family was wondering why we were singing at a funeral, right? Because to them, that culture is just, it's foreign to them. But to us, it was just normal to be singing at a funeral. Um, African peoples reached the pinnacle of achievement in that sphere. Because of the impact of colonialism and cultural imperialism, which will be discussed later, Europeans and Africans themselves in the colonial period lacked due regard for the unique features of African culture. Exactly what I was just saying, right? They, they, they look at it as inferior because they don't appreciate it. Those features have a value of their own that cannot be eclipsed by European culture, either in the comparable period before 1500 or in the subsequent centuries. They cannot be eclipsed because they are not really comparable phenomena. 
who in this world is competent to judge whether an Austrian waltz is better than a Maconde Ngoma? I will ask that again because I want all the white people who will ever listen to this and who are not in solidarity with us to hear that question. Because we're asking you, how dare you think you can tell us how our culture should be? How dare you? Who in this world is competent, competent to judge whether an Austrian waltz is better than a Maconde Ngoma? Like nani alikuambia? Utatuambia ambavyo tunaendeleza utamaduni wetu. That's the question. Who gave you the right to judge how we Africans carry out our culture? Furthermore, even in those spheres of culture that are more readily comparable, such as the fine arts, it is known that African achievements of the pre-European period stand as contribution to man's heritage of beautiful creations. The art of Egypt, the Sudan, and Ethiopia was known to the rest of the world at an early date. That of the rest of Africa is still being discovered and rediscovered by Europeans and present day Africans. The verdict of art historians of the Ife, on the Ife and Benin bronzes is well known. Since they date from the 14th and 15th centuries, they are very relevant to any discussion of African development in the epoch before the contacts with Europe. Nor should they be regarded as unusual except with regard to the material in which the sculptures were executed. The same skill and feeling obviously went into sculpture and artwork in non-durable materials, especially wood. Baba Rodney talks about culture in The Groundings with My Brothers. He has a whole chapter on it. And as far as the Benin sculpture, the bronzes and all that, he talks about the, the European invaders at one point who were so in disbelief that Africans could create such art that they were insisting that there must have been some white people who were here, the Greeks or the Romans. Maybe they influenced this. It cannot be. And it got to a point where they could not deny that these were Africans who were creating, because clearly there were Africans over there and they could see with their left and their right eye an African creating it, right? Anyway, I digress. African dance and art were almost invariably linked with a religious world outlook in one way or another. As is well known, traditional African religious practices exist in great variety. And it should also be remembered that both Islam and Christianity found homes on the African continent almost from the very inception. The features of the traditional African religions helped to set African cultures apart from those in other continents. But in this present context, it is more important to note how much African religion had in common with religion elsewhere and how this can be used as an index to the level of development in Africa before European impact in the 15th century. I'm going to pause there because my garbage truck is here and last time it was interfering. So I'll pause there and we'll have some music and we'll come right back.
Um, we're back and there's no noise, at least no garbage truck noise. So let's get back to it. Religion is an aspect of the superstructure of a society, deriving ultimately from the degree of control and understanding of the material world. However, when man thinks in, religion, in religious terms, he starts from the ideal rather than with the material world, which is beyond his comprehension. Yo, let that sit with you. When man thinks in religious terms, he starts from the ideal rather than with the material world, which is beyond his comprehension. This creates a non-scientific and metaphysical way of viewing the world, which often conflicts with the scientific materialistic outlook and with the development of society. African ancestral religions were no better or worse than other religions as such. But by the end of feudalism, Europeans began to narrow the, the area of human life in which religion and the church played a part. Religion, yeah, I, I won't interrupt. I think Baba Rodney will explain. Religion ceased to dominate politics, geography, medicine. To free those things from religious restraints, it had to be argued that religion had its own sphere and the things of this world had their own secular sphere. That's what Western culture does to African culture. This secularization of life speeded up the development of capitalism and later socialism. In contrast, in the period before the coming of the whites, religion pervaded African life just as it pervaded life in other pre-feudal societies, such as those of the Moiris of Australia and the Afghans of the Afga Afghanistan or the Vikings of Scandinavia. Religion can play both a positive and a negative role as an aspect of the superstructure. In most instances, in early Africa, religious beliefs were associated with the mobilization and discipline of large numbers of people to form states. In a few instances, religion also provided concepts in the struggle for social justice. The negative aspects usually arose out of the tendency of religion to persist unchanged for extremely long periods, especially when the technology of earning a living changes very slowly. This was the case in African societies, as in all other pre-capitalist societies. At the same time, the religious beliefs themselves react upon the mode of production, further slowing up progress in that respect. For instance, belief in prayer and in the intervention of ancestors and various gods could easily be a substitute for innovations designed to control the impact of weather and environment. The same kind of two-sided relationship also exists between the means of earning a living and the social patterns that arise in the process of work. In Africa, before the 15th century, the predominant principle of social relations was that of family and kinship associated with communalism. Every member of an African society had his position defined in terms of relatives on his mother's side and on his father's side. Some societies placed greater importance on multilineal, matrilineal ties and others on patrilineal ties. Those things were crucial to the daily existence of a member of an African society because land, the major means of production, was owned by groups such as the family or clan, the head of which were parents and those yet unborn. Back at home uh, in Kenya, the land where we settle right now, I cannot say is my land. My brother cannot say it's his land. That is our family's land, literally. It's the land that my grandpa got for the family. So it belongs to the family. And it's a large family for that. Um, in theory, this pattern was explained by saying that the residents in any community were all direct descendants of the first person who settled the land, like I just said. When a new group arrived, they often made a pretense that they too had ancestry dating back to the settling of the land, or else they ensured that members of the earliest kin, kin groups continued to perform the ceremonies related to the land and water of the region. Similarly, the labor that worked the land was generally recruited on a family basis. A single family or household would till its own plot, 
and it would also be available to share certain joint farming acti activities with other members of the extended family or clan. Annual hunt and river fishing were also organized by a whole extended family of village community. And this in more recent times is, is seen mostly in the Maasai community. I've seen now they are moving away from their culture, unfortunately, because the Western culture has, has influenced, has started to penetrate their culture. But in more recent times, the Maasai held on to this aspect of their culture. In a matrilineal society, such as that of the Bemba in Zambia, the bridegroom spent a number of years working for the father of his bride. And many young men who had married daughters of the same household often formed work teams to help each other. In Dahomey, a young man did not go to live with his wife's family, but the Dokpue, or work team, allowed a son to participate in carrying out a task of some magnitude for the father of his wife. In both of those examples, the right of the father-in-law to acquire labor and the obligations of the son-in-law to give labor were based on kinship. This can be contrasted with capitalism, where money buys labor, and with this feudal with, and with feudalism, where the serf pro provides labor in order to have access to a portion of land which belongs to the landlord. <clears throat> Having been produced on land that was family property and through family labor the resultant crops and other goods were distributed on the basis of kinship ties. If a man's crops were destroyed by some sudden calamity, relatives in his own village helped him. If the whole community was in distress, people moved to live with their kinsmen in another area where food was not scarce. I'm telling you, we had it right. We need to go back. In Akan country, Ghana, the clan system was highly organized so that a man from Brong could visit Fante many hundreds of miles away and receive food and hospitality from a complete stranger who happened to be of his own clan. And <clears throat> for me growing up, I didn't experience much of this like very communal African culture, but I did experience because my, my, my when I was born, the, the invaders had already come and the influence had already started penetrating our cultures. But we still had that communal spirit where back in the day, my grandma would send us to the neighbor to get something, right? Back in the day, my grandma would pack a bag of, of corn or something, send it to so-and-so. Back in the day, my grandma would tell us, take this milk to so-and-so, you know? Um, that doesn't happen anymore. Numerous examples could be brought forward to show the dominance of the family principle in the communal phase of African development. It affected the two principal factors of production, land and labor, as well as a system of distributing goods. European anthrop anthropologists who have studied African societies have done so mainly from a very prejudiced and racist position, but their researchers can nevertheless provide abundant facts relating to family homesteads and compounds to the extended family, including affinal members who join by association rather than by birth and to lineages and clans which carried the principles of kinship alliances over large areas. However, while the exact details might have differed, similar so social institutions were to be found among the, the Gauls of 11th century France, among the Viet of Indochina at the, same, at, the, at the same date, and virtually everywhere else in the world at one time or another because communalism is one phase through which all human society passed. We need to go back. In all African societies during the early epoch, the individual at every stage of life had a series of duties and obligations to others in the society, as well as a set of rights, namely things that he or she could expect or demand from other individuals. I'm going to repeat that one more time because this is a way of life I am advocating for us to get back to. This is a way of life in the communities that I am a part of organizing with my fellow brothers and sisters that we are organizing together with. This is an, a practice that I'm working very hard to bring back. In all African societies during the early epoch, 
the individual at every stage of life had a series of duties and obligations to others in the society, as well as a set of rights, namely things that he or she could expect or demand from other individuals. Age was a most important factor determining the extent of rights and obligations. The oldest members of the society were highly respected and usually in authority. And the idea of seniority through age was reflected in the presence of age grades and age sets in a great many African societies. Circumcision meant initiation into the society and into adulthood. From that moment, a man was placed with others in his own age group and a woman likewise. Usually, there were at least three age grades corresponding roughly to the young, the middle-aged, and the old. In large parts of Europe, when communalism broke down, it gave way to widespread slavery as the new form in which labor was mobilized. Now, if you all like just logically are looking at a, a, a case study, right? And you see that there's a way of life that people were practicing and it was devoid of harm. We're talking slavery is the harm we're talking about. And those people stop practicing that way of life. In comes the harm, slavery and slave, enslavement of people. Now, <clears throat> after awakening, and for example, if you were a slave feeling the pains and the mafia of that lifestyle, when you come out, you grow, you build, you become a larger generation of people. Like, Would you not stop and say, what? where did we go wrong? We were living this way, everything was right. We didn't have this harm in our society. What happened that introduced this? Or oh, we abandoned that way of life. Then, as people who are trying to solve those problems, would you not go back to that way of life that was favoring your well-being? Like, anyway, this slavery continued throughout the European Middle Ages, with the crusades between Christians and Muslims giving an added excuse for enslaving people. Let's get that right, by the way both Christians and Muslims, enslaved Africans and people. Slavery in turn gave way to serfdom. And, and just as I pause there, there's we uh, in the community um, that I am a part of, we are going to be doing our very best, putting all our efforts in bringing back the truth about the um, the slave trade in East Africa, right? Because that is not spoken of a lot. Africa Mashariki, the the um, the Omans, um, the Portuguese, the English. There was a lot of slave trade in East Africa. We focus mainly on West Africa, which by every right should be focused on because it happened there. Um, there was a there was enslavement of Africans in East Africa. And we will be putting that history back together um, with the help of my brothers and sisters. This slavery continued throughout the European Middle Ages with the crusades between Christians and Muslims giving an added excuse for enslaving people. Slavery in turn gave way to serfdom, whereby the laborer was tied to the land and could no longer be sold and transported. Because it took many years for the transition from slavery to feudalism to take place in Europe, it was common to find that feudal society still retained number of slaves. Parts of China, Burma, and India also had considerable number of slaves as the society moved away from elementary communalism. But there was never any time span when slavery was the dominant mode of production in Asia. This is what differentiates because you argue with Europeans, right? Descendants of enslavers, uh, descendants of oppressors. And they argue with you, oh, Africans used to enslave people, oh, Asians, everyone has enslaved someone. And this is what Baba Rodney is saying. There was never any time span when slavery was the dominant mode of production in Asia. That's the difference right there in Europe with the Americas that slavery became the enslavement of Africans became the dominant mode of production for several years, 400 plus years. In Africa, there were few slaves and there was certainly no epoch of slavery. Most of the slaves in North Africa and other Muslim societies, and in those instances, a man and his family could have the same slave status for generations 
within the ov overall feudal structure of the society. Elsewhere in Africa, communal societies were introduced to the concept of owning alien human beings when they took captives in war. At first, those captives were in a very disadvantaged position, comparable to that of slaves, but very rapidly, captives of their offspring became ordinary members of the society because there was no scope for the potent, no scope for the perpetual exploitation of man by man in a context that was neither feudal nor capitalist. So what does that say of feudalism and capitalism? That there was a perpetual exploitation of man by man. Both Marxists and non-Marxists alike with different motivations have pointed out that the sequ sequence of modes of production noted in Europe were not reproduced in Africa. In Africa, after the communal stage, there was no epoch slave of, of slavery arising out of internal evolution. Nor was there a mode of production which was the replica of European feudalism. Marx himself recognized that the stages of development in Asia had produced a form of society which could not easily be fitted into a European slot. Baba Rodney is referring to Karl Marx. That he called the Asian mode of production. Following along those lines, a number of Marxists have recently been discussing whether Africa was in the same category as Asia or whether Africa had its own African mode of production. The implications of the arguments are very progressive because they are concerned with the concrete conditions of Africa rather than with preconceptions brought from Europe. But the scholars concerned seemed to be bent on finding a single term to cover a variety of social formations which were existing in Africa from about the 5th century AD to the coming of colonialism. Like, again, we talk about Africa being very nuanced. Um, you cannot find one word to describe Africa. You just can't. The assumption that will underlie this study is that most African societies before 1500 were in a transitional stage between the practice of agriculture plus fishing and herding in family communities and the practice of the same activities within states and societies comparable to feudalism. In a sense, all history in tra is transitioned from one stage to another, but some historical situations along the line have more clearly distinguishable characteristics than others. Thus, under communalism, there were no classes and there was equal access to land and equality in distribution at a low level of technology and production. I will read that one more time. I have to be careful what bus buttons I'm pushing on my computer as I read. Um, thus, under communalism, there were no classes and there was equal access to land and equality in distribution at a low level of technology and production. Feudalism involved great inequality in distribution of land and social products. So, Let's get rid of feudalism, right? The landlord class and its bureaucracy controlled the state and used it as an instrument for oppressing peasants, serfs, slaves, and even craftsmen and merchants. The movement from communalism to feudalism in every continent took several centuries. And in some instances, the interruption of internal evolution never allowed the process to mature. In Africa, there is no doubt that the societies which eventually reached feudalism were extremely few. So long as the feudal state was still in the making, elements that were communal coexisted with elements that were feudal and with some peculiarities due to African conditions. The transition was also characterized by a variety of social formations. There were pastoralists and cultivators, fishing societies and trading societies, raiders and nomads. They were all being progressively drawn into a relationship with the land, with each other, and with the state through the expansion of productive forces and the network of distribution. In feudal societies, there were clashes between the landlord and peasant masses, and later on between the landlord and merchant classes. Under capitalism, 
The principal class contradiction inside Europe was between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Those hostile class relations provided the motive force within their respective societies. African communal societies had differences such as age grades and differences between ordinary members and religious leaders such as rainmakers. However, those were not exploitative or antagonistic relations. The concept of class as a motive force in social development had not yet come about. And in the communal phase, one must look at the fundamental forces of production to understand the process of change. Using a number of methods and concepts, it is possible to reconstruct the most likely manner in which isolated family living was broken down and production increased. For instance, the rise of age grades can be seen as responding to the need for greater solidarity because age grades included and cut across many families. Similarly, communal labor was entered into by cross sections of the community to make work more efficient. The Dokpwe work group of Dahomey mentioned above had a wider application in serving the whole community to perform such heavy tasks as clearing land and house building. With the offer of some food and beer or palm wine, some of you still practice this, a work team or work bee could be mobilized in a short time in most African communities, including those of the light-skinned Berbers of North Africa. Of course, while the organization of labor might have helped to produce more, the principal change in the productive forces was that which comprised new techniques using the word in its broadest sense to include both tools and skills in dealing with the environment mid new plant and animal species. The first prerequisite for mastery of the environment is knowledge of that environment. By the 15th century, Africans everywhere had arrived at a considerable understanding of the total eco ecology of the soils, climate, animals, plants, and their multiple interrelationships. We Africans understood the environment around us. The practical application of this lay in the need to trap animals, to build houses, to make utensils, to find medicines, and above all, to devise systems of agriculture. In the centuries before the contact with Europeans, the overwhelming, overwhelmingly dominant activity in Africa was agriculture. In all the settled agricultural communities, people observed the peculiarities of their own environment and tried to find techniques for dealing with it in a rational manner, in a rational manner. Advanced methods were used in some areas, such as terracing, crop rotating, green manu manuring, mixed farming, and reg regulated swamp farming. So for those of you who are asking, oh, what are we going to do now? What is the solution? So what, what answer do you have, Nduko? You want us to get rid of this way of life. What answer do you have? Go back to this way, our way of life. That's the answer I have, which is advanced methods were used in some areas such as terracing, go back to terracing, crop rotating, crop rotating, green manuring, green manuring, where my father would assign us during the holidays. And we were visiting my grandma. Most of the time we spent a lot of time during the holidays with my grandma in the village. We as children would be assigned, wake up in the morning, you go to the cow pen, you dig up the manure from the cow pen, and you go dump it in the garden, and it's going to, to be spread in the garden. That is what we're going back to. Not your fake fertilizer that is being made in a lab, and God knows what's added in it, that is going to come and destroy the soil and the ecosystem. Mixed farming and regulated swamp farming. The single most important technological change underlying African agricultural development was the introduction of iron tools, notably the axe and the hoe, replacing wooden and stone tools. It was on the basis of the iron tools that new skills were elaborated in agriculture as well as in other spheres of economic activity. The coming of iron, the rise of cereal growing, and the, the rise of cereal growing and the making of pottery were all closely related phenomena. In most parts of Africa, it was in the period after the birth of Christ that those things came about. The rate of change over a few centuries was quite impressive. Millet and rice, has, rice had been domesticated from wild grasses 
just as yams were made to evolve from selected wild roots. Most African societies raised the cultivation of their own particular staple to a fine art. Even the widespread resort to shifting cultivation with burning and light hoeing was not as childish as the first European colonialists supposed. That simple form of agriculture was based on a correct evaluation of the soil potential, which was not a great, as great as initially appears from the heavy vegetation. And when the colonialists started upsetting the thin topsoil, the result was disastrous, which is why now a lot of areas in Africa, the soil cannot produce food. <clears throat> the above remarks show that when an outsider comes into a new ecological system, even if he is more skilled those Africans who talk about European civilizations, Africa. Even if he is more skilled, he does not necessarily function as effectively as those who have familiarized themselves with the environment over centuries. And the newcomer is likely to look more ridiculous if, if he is too arrogant to realize that he has something to learn from the natives. Only we Africans by then had been given the Bible and had been miseducated and we couldn't see this. I'm talking generally. There are Africans who could see this and called it out. You have Mekatilili in in uh, the coast of Kenya slapping an English man. The above remarks show that when an outsider comes into a new ecological system, even if he is more skilled, he does not necessarily function as effectively as those who have familiarized themselves with the environment over centuries. What Walter Rodney is telling you, Africans, is that you know your land better. You know how to get the solutions better, better than these invaders who don't know your land. No matter how skilled they are, you know it better. The solutions are in your hands. However, it is not being suggested that African agriculture in the early period was superior to that of other continents. No, on the contrary, African standards of husbandry on the land and with livestock were not as high as those independently evolved in most parts of Asia and Europe. The weakness in Africa seemed to have been the lack of a professional interest in acquiring more scientific knowledge and in devising tools to lighten the load of labor, as well as to transform hostile environments into areas suitable for human activity. As far as agriculture in Europe was concerned, this professionalism was undertaken by the class with a vested interest in the land, namely the feudalist landowners and later the capitalist farmers. It has previously been stated that development is very much determined by the social relations of production. That is, those which have to do with people's functions in producing wealth. Where a few people owned the land and the majority were tenants, this injustice at a particular stage of history allowed the few to concentrate on improving their land. In contrast, under communalism, every African was assured of sufficient land to meet his own needs by virtue of being a member of a family or community. For that reason, and because land was relatively abundant, there were few social pressures or incentives to technic for technical changes to increase pro productivity. In Asia, where much of the land was communally owned, there were tremendous, tremendous advances in some types of farming, especially irrigated farming. This was because the state of India, China, Ceylon, and other places intervened and engaged in irrigation and other hydraulic works on a large scale. This was also true of North Africa, which in most respects followed a pattern of evolution similar to that of Asia. The African land tenure pattern was closer to that of Asia than to that of Europe. But even the most politically developed African states did not play the role of initiators and supervisors of agricultural development. One reason may have been the lack of population pressure and hence the scattered nature of settlements. Another may have been state concentration on trading non-agricultural products to the exclusion of other things. Certainly, when African societies became linked up with other social systems outside the continent on the basis of trade, little attention was paid to agriculture. When it comes to the question of manufacturing in Africa before the time of the white man, it is also essential to recognize where achievements have been underestimated. 
African manufacturers had been contemptuous, contemptuously treated or overlooked by U European writers because the modern conception of the word brings to mind factories and machines. However, manufacturers means literally things made by hand. An African manufacturer in this sense had advanced appreciably. Most African societies fulfilled their own needs for a wide range of articles of domestic use, as well as for farming tools and weapons. Even in my own lifetime, I think they're still there. I, I know it was being uh, threatened by Western ways. Um, we had a place in Kenya called Juwakali. Juwakali because they were working outside with a high sun, like the hot sun. Uh, that's what Juwakali literally means in Kiswahili, hot sun. But you could go buy uh, 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 your charcoal stoves, you could go buy pots, you could go buy uh, cooking uh, utensils, um, the, the, the suitcases that we needed to go to boarding school with. Like, they still have them there. People with their hands making, like all day at Juakali, the sound is ding, 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 the hammer on the metal. They make different tools that are useful in the homestead. One way of judging the level of economic development in Africa five centuries ago is through the quality of the products. Here, a few examples will be given of articles which came to the notice of the outside world. Through North Africa, Europeans became familiar with a superior brand of red leather from Africa, which was termed Moroccan leather. Let's get that straight for those of you who talk about the Europeans civilized us. Through North Africa, Europeans became familiar. They learned with a superior bland, brand of red leather from Africa, which was termed Moroccan leather. So what goes wrong where we end up thinking that we cannot do without Europeans? That's my question. In fact, it was turned and dyed by Hausa and Mandinga specialists in Northern Nigeria and Mali. When direct contact was established between Europeans and Africans on the East and West coasts, many more impressive items were displayed. As soon as the Portuguese reached the old kingdom of Congo, they sent back word on the superb local clothes made from bark and palm fiber. Like what happened to us Africans? And having a finish comparable to velvet. The Baganda were also expert bark cloth makers. Yet Africa had even better to offer in the form of cotton cloth, which was widely manufactured before the coming of Europeans. Like y'all, seriously. Well into, well into the present century, local cottons, cottons from the Guinea coast were stronger than Manchester cottons. Once European products reached Africa, Africans too were in a position to make comparisons between their commodities and those from outside. In Katanga and Zambia, the local copper continued to be preferred to the imported items. What happened to us? I'm sorry. I can't even, like, I can't help myself as I read this. Like, we, we were perfect. We were. In Katanga and Zambia, the local copper continued to be preferred to the imported items. That mindset has been flipped. Now Africans think things coming from outside is, uh, is what's better than what is there. While the same held true for iron in a place like Sierra Leone. We had black consciousness. That's what we've lost. Black conscience, conscience. we actually had it. It was at the level of scale that African manufacturers had not made a breakthrough. This is to say, the cotton looms were small, the iron smelters were small, the pottery was turned slowly by hand and not on a wheel. Yet some changes were taking place in this context. Under communalism, each household made, met its own needs by making its own clothes, pots, mats, and such. So the way I envision this, because I will be going back to this, at least I'll attempt my level best to go back to this, is in a community, a shared community of people, we can go back to where in that community we are making our own clothes, our own pots, our own mats and such. And we can share with neighbors, right? We can do it. It was done before. <clears throat> that was true of every continent. 
However, economic expansion, and that's the problem, economic expansion. Because we're greedy, because of human beings' greed, economic expansion from there on was associated with specialization and localization of industry. People's needs being met by exchange. You talk about that today, you tell someone, oh, can you do this for me? What am I getting in exchange? I literally had a program I was introducing at my daughter's school at one point where I was going to connect a school back at home in Kenya with a school here. The idea was for these students to interact because I, I sensed, at least I saw in my daughter's school, just the lack of appreciation of the, the things that they had, right? And the taking for granted the things that they had. And I wanted them to interact with children who had, who didn't have the, the resources that they had, but were doing really well in school just to learn and appreciate more what they had. But also for our children to see that they're not as, as different. But the question that was asked by the parents in that uh, PTA and, and, and group that was organizing that is what do we get in return? You all know me, I almost lost it. But anyway, this trend was displayed in the principal African manufacturers and notably in the cloth industry. Cotton fiber had to be G-I-N-N-E-D, either ginned or ginned, separated from the seed, then carded and spun into yarn before being woven. Either the yarn or the woven cloth had to be dyed, and the making of the dye itself was a, was a complex process. There was a time when all these stages would be performed by a single family, or rather by the women in a single family, as in Yoruba land. <clears throat> But economic development was reflected in the separation of dyeing from cloth making and the separation of spinning from weaving. Each separation marked greater specialization and quantitative and qualitative changes in output. So play with words there. European industry has been in intensively studied and it is generally recognized that <clears throat> in addition to new machinery, a most decisive factor in the growth of industry was the changeover from domestic production to the factory system, with a guild marking an intermediary stage. The guild was an association of specialists, passing on their skills by training apprentices and working in buildings set aside for that purpose. Africa, too, had elements of the guild system. At Timbuktu, there were tailor tailoring guilds, while in Benin, guilds of a very restricted caste type controlled the famous brass and bronze industry. In Nupe, now northern Nigeria, the glass and head industry operated on a guild basis. Each Nupe guild had a common workshop and a master. The master obtained contracts, financed the guild, and disposed of the product. Both his own relatives as well as strangers were free to enter the guild and learn the various specialized tasks within the glass industry. With this, what this amounted to was simply that there was increasing specialization and division of labor. Traditional African economies are usually called subsistence economies. Often, small villages farmed, hunted, fished, and looked after themselves independently with little reference to the rest of the continent. Yet, at the same time, the vast majority of African communities fulfilled at least a few of their needs by trade. Africa was a continent of innumerable trade routes. Some extended from, for long distances, like the routes across the Sahara or the routes connected with Katanga Copper. I actually come from a, a, <clears throat> a people that is known for long distance trading, the Kamba people, the Akamba people of Kenya. Um, and my people would travel all the way from the center, we're somewhere center east of Kenya, to the coast, walking and back, doing trade. <clears throat> and that's where they were kidnapped and enslaved, um, <clears throat> taken to Zanzibar and taken to other parts of the world. But in the main, it was trade between neighboring or not too far distant societies. Such trade was always a function of production. Various communities were producing surpluses of given commodities, which could be exchanged for items which they lacked. In that way, the salt industry of one locality would be stimulated while the iron industry would be encouraged in another. So think about that in Africa right now. 
when you talk about Africa kicking out Europe, right? Imperialists kicking out all those banks that that have exploited you all those years, kicking out all those nonprofits, including Bill Gates. I told you I have a special space for him. Um, and you all ask, what are we going to do? How is Africa going to survive? Okay. In Congo, they are producing this. In Kenya, they are producing this that they don't have in Congo. Okay, Congo, can we have this and we can give you this that we have in Kenya? Like the exchange, right? They're building a dam now in Ethiopia. Okay, we're going to distribute electricity. We don't have this in Ethiopia. Can we get this to the people who we are distributing? That just... <laughs> in a coastal lake or river area, dried fish could become profitable while yams and millet would be grown in abundance elsewhere to provide a basis for exchange. The trade so readily distinguishable in every part of the continent between the 10th and 15th centuries was an excellent indicator of economic expansion and other forms of development which accompanied increasing mastery over the environment. As part of the extension of trade, it was noticeable that barter was giving way to some forms of money exchange. And I think we went wrong there. We need to go back to barter trade. When you think about it, I'm not talking about this lifestyle where you're going to a yard and you're buying Gucci. I'm actually talking about getting rid of that lifestyle. You all have to be uh, comfortable with doing that. But if we're going to remain in that society where we are all Gucci-fied and Nike-fied, um, we have to be okay with it. We have to stop complaining about how bad the world is because we are allowing it. We are the ones who are feeding it. So if we want to solve the problems the world currently has, we have to be okay with giving up the Gucci and the Nike and wearing something that the local person has built and that you can give them something in return for what they have, something that they need that they don't have than you have. Barter was generally practiced when the volume of trade was small and when only a few commodities were involved. However, as trade became more complicated, some items began to be used as the standards of measuring other goods. Those items could be kept as a form of wealth, easily transformed into other commodities when the need arose. <clears throat> For example, salt, cloth, iron hose, and cowrie shales were popular forms of money in Africa. Apart from gold and copper, which were much rarer, and therefore restricted to measuring things of great value. In a few places such as North Africa, Ethiopia, and the Congo, the monetary systems were quite sophisticated, indicating that the economy was far removed from simple barter and subsistence. There were many other changes of a socio-political nature accompanying the expansion of the productive forces. Indeed, things such as agricultural practices, industry, trade, money, and political structures were inseparable, each interacting with the others. The most developed areas of Africa were those where all elements converged and the two sociopolitical features, which were the outstanding indices to development, were the increase of stratification and the consolidation of states. The principles of family and deferment to age were slowly breaking down throughout the centuries, preceding the arrival of, of Europeans in their sailing ships. Changes in technology and the, in the division of labor made that inevitable. The introduction of iron, for example, gave economic and military strength to those who, would, who could make and acquire it. Better tools meant more food and a greater population, but the latter tended to outrun the supplies of material goods. And the possibilities of wealth opened up by the possession of iron were seized upon by a few to their own advantage. Skilled workers in iron, cloth, pottery, leather, or salt making tended to pass on their skills in closed groups known as castes. The trouble starts being introduced into society, right? Castes. That ensured that the division of labor operated in their favor because their position was privileged and strategic. The one percenters, castes. Iron workers were particularly favored in some African societies in which they either became the ruling groups or were very close to the top of the social 
hierarchy. The division of labor also carried over into non-material spheres, producing professional minstrels and historians. They too had certain special rights and privileges, notably the ability to criticize freely without fear of reprisal. <laughs> In some circumstances, skilled castes were reduced to very low status, but that was rare. And in any ease, it does not contradict the general assertion that the tendency was for communalism to give rise to more and more stratification. Social stratification was the basis for the rise of classes and for social antagonisms. To some extent, this was a logical follow-up of the previous non-antagonistic differences in communal society. For instance, old men could use their control over land allocation over bride price and over other traditional exchanges to try to establish themselves as a privileged economic stratum. Secret societies arose in the area that is now Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, and they permitted knowledge, power, and wealth to pass into the hands of the elders and ultimately to the elders of particular lineages. The contradiction between young men and their elders was not the type that caused violent revolution. But young men clearly had reasons for resenting their dependence on elders, especially when it came to such vital personal matters as the acquisition of wives. When disgruntled, they could either leave their communities and set up for themselves, or they could challenge the principles within the society. In either case, the trend was that some individuals and families were more successful than others, and those families established themselves as permanent rulers. Then age ceased to matter as much because even a junior could succeed his father once the notion of royal blood or royal lineage was established. You all see where the problem is coming in, right? In the period of transition, while African society retained many features that were indisputably communal, it also accepted the principle that some families or clans or lineages were destined to rule and others were not. This was true not only of cultivators, but of pastoralists as well. In fact, livestock became unevenly distributed much more readily than land, and those families with the largest herds became socially and politically dominant. An even more important aspect of the process of social stratification was that brought was that brought about was that brought about by contact was that brought about by contact between different social formations. Fishermen had to relate to cultivators and the latter to pastoralists. There were even social formations such as bands of hunters and food gatherers who had not yet entered the phase of communal cooperation. Often the relationship was peaceful. In many parts of the African continent, there arose what is known as symbiosis between groups earning their living in different ways, which really means that they agreed to exchange goods and coexist to their mutual advantage. However, there was also room for considerable conflict, and when one group imposed itself by force on another, the result was invariably the rise of social classes with the conquerors on top and the conquered at the bottom. The most common clashes between different social formations were those between pastoralists and cultivators. In some insta instances, the cultivators had the upper hand, as for instance, in West Africa, where cultivators like the Mandinga and Hausa, Hausa were the overlords of the Rulani cattlemen right up to the 18th and 19th centuries. The reverse situation was found in the Horn of Africa and most of East Africa, I was about to say. Another type of clash was that in which raiding peoples took power over agriculturalists, as happened in Angola and in around the Sahara where the Moors and the Tuareg exacted tribute from an even enslaved, <clears throat> and even enslaved more peaceful and sedentary people. The result in each case was that a relatively small faction held control of the land and where relevant, cattle, mines, and long distance trade. It meant also that the minority group could make demands on the labor of their subjects, not on the basis of kinship, but because a relationship of domination and subordination existed. But Barodney is painting a path 
we're going back in time to figure out where the mistakes happened, to figure out where the problems infected our communities. This is what he's doing. In truly communal societies, the leadership was based on religion and family ties. The senior members of the society shared the work with others and received more or less the same share of the total product. Certainly, no one starved while others stuffed themselves and threw away the excess. However, once African societies began to expand by internal evolution, conquest, or trade, the style of life of the ruling group became noticeably different. They consumed the most and the best that the society offered. Yet, they were least directly involved in the production of wealth by farming, cattle herding, or fishing. If you all do not realize that that is selfish, and you can see it in our lifestyles today, if you all do not see that as selfish, those of you who are complaining about immigrants that you're going to, to the grocery store to buy the food that they're picking, if you all don't see that as selfish, I don't know what is. And you need to awaken. You've lost your minds. The ruling class and the kings in particular had the right to call upon the labor of the common man for certain projects and for a given number of days per year. This is known as Covey uh, la labor from a similar procedure followed in feudal France. Such a system meant greater exploitation and at the same time, greater development of production, productive resources. <clears throat> Social stratification as outlined above went hand in hand with the rise of the state. The notion of royal lineages and commoner clans could not have any meaning except in a political state with a concrete geographical existence. It is significant that the great dynasties of the world ruled over feudal states. I'm going to say this as I continue to reading, uh, to read and as I make commentary. I'm not sitting here making commentary because I'm perfect. I'm not. I'm not sitting here making commentary because I'm saying I got it and this is the way we do it. You all join me. You all are lost. No, I'm saying I once was where a lot of Africans still are, thinking that the, the sun rises from the behinds of Europeans um, and without their behinds, there's no sun in Africa. Uh, and thinking that the U.S. was the best thing that ever happened to Africa and the U.N. as well. I was that believer. I was the believer of uh, the, the education in the U.S. is going to help me. Uh, I'm going to make good money. I'm going to do great for my family. But it is in being in the U.S. and seeing how these people think of Africans and seeing how they behave and seeing how they go about their culture. And as I get older and wiser, I guess, from experience, um, I realize, and I, I, I juxtapose that with my family at home, the more I go back and forth, right? You get to have that experience where you're juxtaposing. It is in that that you awaken and realize, what is this lifestyle we're holding on to that is oppressing so many people? just so that I can have a nice house, uh, fancy car, eat in fancy restaurants, have th those people who go to restaurants and order these expensive drinks, just for that? Instead of a lifestyle where I don't have to see homeless people in New York because there's no homeless people. I don't have to see in the TV people who are starving because there are no people who are starving. I would rather have that lifestyle. I will give up that expensive trip in a restaurant to have a lifestyle where others are not suffering at the expense of me living a luxurious life. I came to that realization, which is why I talk the way I talk. And I'm hoping that more people come to that realization because I honestly think that is the solution. That is where the solution lies in humanities, in our saving humanity that we will all be willing to share what we have. We will all be willing to spread the resources so that more human beings, if not all human beings have access to them instead of accumulating for self. Excess, like things we don't even need. When some of us, like if we could just take the things out of our house and put them out there, some of them you haven't even used for years. If transferred into cash, that could help someone else. Anyway. To the European or European-trained ear, 
the name of the Tudors, Bourbons, Hohenzollerns, and Romanovs, Romanovs would already be familiar. Japan had its Kamakuras and its to Tokuga. To to Tokuga was? China had its Tang and its Ming. India had its Guptas and its Marathas, and so on. All of those were feudal dynasties existing in a period some centuries after the birth of Christ. But in addition, there were dynasties which ruled in each of those countries before feudal land tenure and class relations had fully crystallized. Excuse me. It means that the transition to feudalism in Europe, <coughs> excuse me, and Asia saw the rise of ruling groups and the state as interdependent parts of the same process. Excuse me. We're going to take a quick break. I need to, yeah, we'll take a quick break. Sorry about that. Life happens. It means that the transition to feudalism in Europe and Asia saw the rise of ruling groups and the state as interdependent parts of the same process. In that respect, Africa was no different. From a political perspective, the period of transition from communalism to feudalism in Africa was one of, st of state formation. At the beginning and for many centuries, the state remained weak and immature. It acquired definite territorial boundaries, but inside those boundaries, subjects lived in their own communities with scarcely any contact with the ruling class until the time came to pay an annual tax or tribute. <laughs> Only when a group within the state refused to pay the tribute did the early African states mobilize their repressive machinery in the form of an army to demand what is considered as its rights from subjects? I don't know why that is reminding me of the IRS. I don't know why. <laughs> Slowly, various states acquired greater power over their many communities of citizens. They, exact, they exacted Kovi labor, they enlisted soldiers, and they appointed regular tax collectors and local administrators. So check this out, you all. This is where this whole thing of, of, of armies and soldiers comes in. From a political perspective, the period of transition from communalism to feudalism in Africa was one of state formation. At the beginning, and for many centuries, the state remained weak and immature. It acquired definite territorial boundaries. But inside those boundaries, subjects lived in their own communities with scarcely any contact with the ruling class until the time came to pay an annual tax or tribute. Only when a group within the state refused to pay the tribute did the early African states mobilize their repressive machinery in the form of an army to demand what is it considered as its rights from subjects. Slowly, Various states acquired greater power over their many communities of citizens. 
they exacted COVID labor. They enlisted soldiers and they appointed regular tax collectors and local administrators. Where did we go wrong? The areas of Africa in which labor relations were breaking out of communal restrictions corresponded to areas in which sophisticated political states were emerging. The rise of states was itself a form of development, which increased the scale of African politics and merged small ethnic groups into wider identities suggestive of nations. In some ways, too much importance is attached to the growth of political states. It was in Europe that the nation state reached an advanced stage and Europeans tended to use the presence or absence of well-organized polities as a measure of civilization. This is not entirely justified because in Africa, there were small political units which had relatively advanced material and non-material cultures. For instance, neither the Igbo people of Nigeria nor the Kikuyu of Kenya ever produced large centralized governments in their traditional setting. But both had sophisticated systems of political rule based on clans and in the case of the Igbo, on religious oracles and secret societies. You all know about the Kenyan Land and Freedom Army, right? Both of them were efficient agriculturalists and iron workers, and the Igbo had been manufacturing brass and bronze items ever since the 9th century AD, if not earlier. However, after making the above qualification, it can be considered that on the whole, the larger states in Africa had the most effective political structures and greater capacity for producing food, clothing, minerals, and other material artifacts. It can readily be understood that those societies which had ruling classes were concerned with acquiring luxury and prestige items. This is what I'm talking about. The privileged groups in control of the state were keen to stimulate manufacturers as well as to acquire them through trade. They were the ones that mobilized labor to produce a greater supplies above subsistence needs. And in the process, they encouraged specialization and the division of labor. In other words, they are the ones that mobilized labor to produce excess, more than we need. Scholars often distinguish between groups in Africa which had states and those which were stateless. Sometimes the word stateless is carelessly or even abusively used, but it does describe those people who had no machinery or government coercion and no concept of a political unit wider than the family or the village. After all, if there is no class stratification in a society, it follows that there is no state because the state arose as an instrument to be used by a particular class to control the rest of society in its own interests. For example, how is it that, how many men now, oh, well, there are a few women, the, the, the Supreme Court in the United States. And I, I point out the United States, first of all, because it's currently just the biggest offender of human rights, but also because I am living within it, um, that a few people in the Supreme Court are making laws for a like millions of people. And we're okay with that as human beings. <laughs> Generally speaking, one can consider the stateless societies as among the older forms of socio-political organization in Africa, while the large states represented an evolution away from communalism, sometimes to the point of feudalism. Again, it must be emphasized that a survey of the scene in Africa before the coming of Europeans would reveal considerable unevenness of development. There were social formations representing hunting hands, communalism, feudalism, and many positions intermediate between the two, the last two. The remainder of this section will be devoted to a review of the principal features of several of the most developed societies and states of Africa in the last thousand years or so before Africa came into permanent contact with Europe. The areas to be considered are Egypt, Ethiopia, Nubia, Morocco, the Western Sudan, the intra interlacustrine zone of East Africa and Zimbabwe. Each serves as an example of what development meant in early Africa and what the direction of social movement was. To a greater or lesser extent, each was also a leading force on the continent in the sense of carrying neighbors along the same path. 
either by absorbing them or influencing them more indirectly. Some concrete examples. Egypt. It is logical to start with Egypt as the oldest culture in Africa which rose to eminence. The glories of Egypt under the pharaohs are well known and do not need recounting. At one time, it used to be said or assumed that ancient Egypt was not African. A curious view is no longer seriously profound, pro propounded. However, for the present purposes, it is more relevant to refer to Egypt under Arab and Turkish rule from the, from the, century, from the 7th century onward. During that latter period, the ruling class was foreign, and that meant that Egypt's internal development was tied up with other countries, notably Arabia and Turkey. Colonized Egypt sent abroad great amounts of wealth in the form of food and revenue, and that was a very negative factor. But the tendency was for the rural, ruling foreigners to break with their own imperial masters and to act simply as a ruling elite within Egypt, which became an independent feudal state. One of the first features of feudalism to arrive in Egypt was the military aspect. The Arab, Turk, and Circassian invaders were all military inclined. This was particularly true of the Mamluks, who held power from the 13th century onwards. Political power in Egypt from the 7th century lay in the hands of a military oligarchy, which delegated the actual government to bu bureaucrats, thereby creating a situation similar to that in places like China and Indochina. Even more fundamental was the fact that land tenure relations were undergoing change in such a way that a true feudal class came on the scene. All the conquerors made land grants to their followers and military captains. Initially, the land in Egypt was the property of the state to be rented out to cultivators the state had had the right to reappropriate the land and allocate it once more. Somewhat like the head of a village community acting as the guardian of the lands of related families. However, the ruling military elements also became a new class of landowners. By the 15th century, most of the land in Egypt was the property of the Sultan and his military lords. If there was a small class which monopolized most of the land, it followed that there was a large class of the landless. Peasant cultivators were soon converted into mere agricultural labor, laborers tied to the soil as tenants or vessels of the feudal landlords. These peasants with little or no land were known as the fellahin. In Europe, there are legends about the exploitation and suffering of the Russian serfs as muskik under feudalism. In Egypt, the exploitation of the fellahin was carried out, carried out even more thoroughly. The feudalists had no interest in the fellahin beyond seeing that they produced revenue. Most of the what the peasants produced was taken from them in the form of tax. And the tax collectors were asked to perform the miracle of taking from the peasants even what that which they did not have. When their demands were not met, the peasants were brutalized. The antagonistic nature of the contradiction between the feudal warrior landlord and the fellahin was revealed by a number of peasant revolts, notably in the early part of the 8th century. In no continent was feudalism an epoch of romance for the laboring classes, but the elements of development were seen in the technology and the increase in productive capacity. Under the patronage of the Fatimid, Di Fatimid dynasty, 1969 AD to 1170 AD, Science flourished and industry reached a new level in Egypt. Windmills and water wheels were introduced from Persia in the 10th century. New industries were introduced, paper making, sugar refining, porcelain, and the distillation of gasoline. The older industries of textile, leather, and metal were improved upon. The succeeding dynasties of the Ayyubids and the Mamluks also achieved a great deal especially in the building of canals, dams, bridges, and aqueducts, and in stimulating commerce in Europe, with Europe. Egypt at that time was still able to teach Europe many things and was flexible enough to receive new techniques in return. Although feudalism was based on the land, it usually developed towns at the expense of the countryside. 
the high points of Egyptian feudal culture was associated with the towns. The Fatimids founded Cairo, which became one of the most famous and most cultured cities in the world. At the same time, they established the Azhar University, which exists today as one of the oldest in the world. The feudalists and the rich merchants were the ones who benefited most, but the craftsmen and other city dwellers of Cairo and Alexandria were able to participate to some extent in the leisured lives of the towns. Ethiopia. Ethiopia too, at the start of its history as a great power was ruled over by foreigners. The kingdom of Aksum was one of the most important of the nuclei around which feudal Ethiopia eventually emerged. And Aksum was founded near the Red Sea coast by a dynasty of Serbian origin from the other side of the Red Sea. But the kings of Aksun were never agents of foreign powers and they became completely Africanized. The founding of Aksun goes back to the first century AD and its ruling class was Christianized within a few centuries. After that, they moved inland and participated in the development of the Christi Christian feudal Ethiopian state. The Ethiopian, Tigrayan, and Amharic ruling class was a proud one, tracing its descent to Solomon. As a state which incorporated several other smaller states and kingdoms, it was an empire in the same sense as feudal Austria or Persia. The emperor of Ethiopia was addressed as conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, elect of God, emperor of Ethiopia, king of kings. In practice, however, the Solomonic line was not unbroken. Most of the consolidation of the inland Ethiopian plateau was carried out in the 12th century by an intruding dynasty, the Zagwe, who made claims to descend from Moses. The Zagwe kings distinguished themselves by building several churches cut out of solid rock. You can still see those in Ethiopia. The architectural achievements attest to the level of skill reached by Ethiopians as well as the capacity of the state to mobilize labor on a huge scale. Such tax tasks could not have been achieved by voluntary family labor, but only through the labor of an exploited class. A great deal is known of the superstructure of the Ethiopian empire, especially its Christianity and its literature culture, literate culture. History was written to glorify the king and the nobility especially under the restored Solomoni dynasty, which replaced the Zagwe in 1270 AD. Fine illuminated books and manuscripts became a prominent element of Amharic culture. Equally, fine garments and jewelry were produced for the ruling class and for the church. The top ecclesiastics were part of the nobility and the institution of the monastery grew to great proportions in Ethiopia. The association of organized religion with the state was implicit in communal societies, where the distinction between politics, economics, religion, medicine was scarcely drawn. Under feudalism, everywhere, church and state were in close alliance. The Buddhists were preeminent in feudal Vietnam, Burma, Japan, and to a lesser extent in China. In India, a limited Buddhist influence was overwhelmed by that of the Hindus and Muslims. And of course, in feudal Europe, it was the Catholic Church which played, which played the role paralleled by the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia. The wealth of Ethiopia rested on an agricultural base. The fertile uplands supported cereal growing and there was considerable livestock raising, including the rearing of horses. Craft skills were developed in a number of spheres and foreign craftsmen were encouraged. For instance, early in the 15th century, Turkish artisans settled in the country and made coats, coats of mail and weapons for the Ethiopian army. Coptics from Egypt were also introduced to help run the financial administration. No one des denies that the word feudal can be applied to Ethiopia in those centuries because there existed a clear-cut class contradiction between the landlords and the peasants. Those relations grew out of the communalism, communalism that had characterized Ethiopia, like other parts of Africa much earlier. Feudal Ethiopia included lands that were communally owned by village and ethnic communities, 
as well as lands belonging directly to the crown. But in addition, large territories were conferred by the conquering Amharic dynasties on members of the royal family and on soldiers and priests. Those who received huge areas of land became Ras. You hear Ras Makonen, Ras this, Ras that. Or provincial princes, and they had judges appointed by the emperor attached to them. The peasants in their domain were reduced to tenants who could earn their living only by offering produce to the landlord and taxes to the state, also in produce. I have, I'm connecting that to the Rastafarians in Jamaica. You hear a few Rastafarians calling themselves Ras this, Ras that, you know, that is that reconnecting back to that culture. The landlords exempted themselves from tax, a typical situation in feudal societies and one which fed the fires of revolution in Europe when the bourgeois class grew powerful enough to challenge the fact that the feudalists were using political power to tax everyone but themselves. Ethiopia, of course, never reached that stage of transition to capitalism, which is clear. What is clear is that the transition to feudalism had been made. Nubia. Nubia was another Christian region in Africa, but one which is not so famous as Ethiopia. In the 6th century AD, Christianity was introduced into the, middle, into the Middle Nile in the districts once ruled by the famous state of Kush and Moro. In the period before the birth of Christ, Kush was a rival to Egypt in splendor, and it ruled Egypt for a number of, number of years. Its decline in the 4th century AD was completed by attacks from the then expanding Axum. The three small Nubian states which arose some time afterwards were to some extent the heirs of Kush, although after their conversion to Christianity, it was this religion which dominated Nubian culture. The Nubian states, which had consolidated to two by about the 8th century, achieved most from the 9th to the 11th centuries, in spite of great pressures, pressures from Arab and Islamic enemies, and they did not finally succumb until the 14th century. Scholarly interest in Nubia has focused on the ruins of large red brick churches and monasteries, which had murals of frescoes of fine quality. Several conclusions can be drawn from the material evidence. In the first place, a great deal of labor was required to build those churches, along with the stone fortifications which often surrounded them. As with the pyramids of Egypt or the feudal castles of Europe, the common builders were intensely exploited and probably coerced. Secondly, skilled labor was involved in the making of the bricks and in the architecture. The paintings indicate that the skills surpassed mere manual dexterity, and the same artistic merit is noticeable in fragments of painted pottery recovered from Nubia. It has already been indicated that the churches and monasteries played a major role in Ethiopia, and this is worth elaborating on with respect to Nubia. The monastery was a major unit of production. Numerous peasants had Peasant huts were clustered around each monastery, which functioned very much as did the, main, the manner of a feudal lord. The wealth that accumulated inside the churches was alienated from the peasants, while the finest aspects of the non-material culture, such as books, were accessible only to a small minority. Not only were the peasants illiterate, but in many cases, they were non-Christians or only nominally Christian judging from the better known Ethiopian example of the same date. When the Christian ruling class of Nubia was eliminated by the Muslims, very little of the achievements of the old state remained in the fabric of the people's daily lives. Such reversals in the historical process are not uncommon throughout human experience. Ultimately, the dialectic of development asserts itself, but some ebbing and flowing is inevitable. The Nubian states were not in existence in the 15th century, but they constitute a legitimate example of the potentialities of African development. One can go further and discern that Kush was still contributing to the African development long after the kingdom had declined and given way to Christian Nubia. It is clear that Kush was a center from which many positive cultural elements diffused to the rest of Africa. Brasswork of striking similarity to that of Moreau 
was reproduced in West Africa, and the technique by which West Africans cast their brass is generally held to have originated in Egypt and to have been passed on by way of Kush. Above all, Kush was one of the earliest and most vigorous centers of iron mining and smelting in Africa, and it was certainly one of the sources from which this crucial aspect of technology passed to the rest of the continent. That is why the Middle Nile was a leading force in the social, economic, and political development of Africa as a whole. The Maghreb. Islam was the great revealed religion which played the major role in the period of the feudal development of the Maghreb. The lands at the western extremity of the Islamic empires that stretched across Africa, Asia, and Europe within years of the Prophet Muhammad's death, death in the seventh century of Christian era, of the Christian era. The Arab empire building under the banner of Islam is a classic example of the role of religion in that, as, in that respect. Ibn Khaldun, a great 14th century North African historian, was of the opinion that Islam was the most important force allowing the Arabs to transcend the narrow boundaries of small family communities, which were constantly struggling among each other. He wrote, Arab pride, touchiness, and intense jealousy of power render it impossible for them to agree. Only when their nature has been permeated by a religious impulse are they transformed, so that the tendency to anarchy is replaced by a spirit of mutual defense. Consider the moment when religion dominated their policy and led them to observe a religious law designed to promote the moral and material inter interests of civilization. Under a series of successes to the Prophet Muhammad, how vast their empire became and how strongly was it established. The above remarks by Ibn Khaldun cover only one aspect of Arab imperial expansion, but it was certainly a crucial one and attested to the essential role of ideology in the developmental process. That has to be considered in relation to and in addition to the material circumstances. Furthermore, in judging the material conditions at any given time, which might form the basis for further expansion of production and further growth of the society's power, it is also necessary to consider the historical legacy. Like Islamic Egypt and Christian Nubia, the Maghreb of the Islamic dynasties inherited a rich historical and cultural tradition. It was the seat of the famous society of Carthage, which nourished between 1200 BC and 200 BC, and which was a blend of foreign influences before the Eastern Mediterranean with the Berber peoples of the Maghreb. The region had subsequently been an important section of the Roman and Byzantine empires. And before becoming Muslim, the Maghreb had actually distinguished itself as a center of non-conformist Christianity, which meant under the name which went under the name of Donatism. The striking achievements of Muslim Maghreb we spread over the naval, military, commercial, and cultural spheres. Its navies controlled the Western Mediterranean and its armies took over most of Portugal and Spain. When the Muslim advance into Europe was turned back in the year 732 AD, North African armies were already deep into France. In the 11th century, the armies of the Almoravid dynasty gathered strength from deep within Senegal and Mauritania and launched themselves across the Strait of Gibraltar to reinforce Islam in Spain, which was being threatened by Christian kings. For over a century, the Almora Almoravid rule in North Africa and Iberia was characterized by commercial wealth and a resplendent literary and architectural record. After being ejected from Spain in the 1230s, the Maghreb Muslims, or Moors, as they were called, continued to maintain a dynamic society of African soil, on African soil. As one, index, as one index to the standard of social life, it has been pointed out that public baths were common in the cities of Maghreb at a time when, in Oxford, the doctrine was still being propounded that the washing of the body was a dangerous act. One of the most intrusive, instructive aspects of the history of the Maghreb is the interaction of social formations to produce the state. 
A major problem that had been resolved was that of integrating the isolated Berber groups into larger political communities. There were also contradictions between sedentary groups and nomadic pastoral sectors of the populations. The Berbers were mainly pastoralists. <laughs> Please do not make me choke Marie Antoinette. The Berbers were mainly pastoralists organized in patriarchal clans and in groups of clans and in groups of clans connected by a democratic council of all adult males. Grazing land was under communal ownership and maintaining irrigation was also a collective responsibility for the agriculturalists. Yet, cooperation within kin groups contrasted with hostility between those who had no immediate blood ties. And it was only in the face of the Arab invaders that the Berbers united. Using a non-conformist Kharijite Islam as their ideology. I'm just going to take this moment of humor and, and go back to the bathing since Marie Antoinette is taking us back there. Africa taught Europeans how to wash themselves. That's what this is saying. We taught Europeans how to wash themselves. They were scared to wash themselves. They considered it dangerous. We were like, nah, y'all stink. Look at us, we don't stink. This is what we do not to stink. But they brought civilization to Africa. The Kharijite revolt of 739 AD is considered in one sense as being na nationalistic and in another sense, a revolt of the exploited classes against the Arab military, bureaucratic and theocratic elite who professed the Orthodox Sunni Islam. That revolt of the Berber masses laid the basis for Moroccan nationalism. And three centuries later, the Almohad dynasty, 1147 to 1270, brought political unity to the whole Maghreb as a product of the synthesis of Berber and Arab achievements in the, in the sphere of state building. Listen, thank you. If you for centuries have been telling African people that they are backwards, they're uncivilized, and then African people find out that they taught you how to wash themselves, we are going to hold on to that for a while just to make ourselves feel better. It's petty, but it's okay. Compared to what you did to us, we will hold on to that. Unfortunately, the Maghreb nation did not last. And instead, the region was bequeathed the nuclei of three nation states, <clears throat> Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Within each of the three areas, divisive tendencies were very strong in the 14th and 15th centuries. For instance, in Tunisia, the ruling Hafsid dynasty was constantly involved in crushing local rebellions and defending the integrity of the state. It has been noted already that the political state in Africa and elsewhere was a consequence of development of the productive forces. But the state in turn also conditioned the rate at which the economy advanced because the two were dialectically interrelated. Therefore, the failure of the Maghreb to build a nation state and the difficulties of consolidating state power even within the three divisions of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia were factors holding back the further development of the region. Moreover, Political division weakened the Maghreb vis-a-vis -vis foreign enemies, and Europe was soon to take advantage of those internal weaknesses. That is what Europe did. It took advantage of our weaknesses. So if we are going to correct, we best understand what those weaknesses are or were and eradicate them from our culture by launching attacks from the year 1415 onwards. Moreover, political division weakened the Maghreb vis-a-vis -vis foreign enemies, and Europe was soon to take advantage of those internal weaknesses by launching attacks from the year 1415 onwards. The experience of the Maghreb can be drawn upon to illustrate the lengthy nature of transition from the one mode of production to another, and the fact that two different ways of organizing society could coexist side by side over centuries. Throughout the period under discussion, a great deal of land in that part of Africa retained its communal ownership and family labor. Meanwhile, considerable socioeconomic stratification had taken place and antagonistic classes had emerged. At the very bottom of the ladder were the slaves, or Haritin, 
who were most often black Africans from south of the Sahara. Then came the Akami, or landless peasants, who worked the proprietor's land and gave the latter four-fifths of whatever was produced. Special mention should be of the position of women, who were not a class by themselves, but who suffered from deprivations at the hands of their own menfolk and of the male-controlled ruling class. So patriarchy comes in. Therefore, the women in the Akami class were in a very depressed condition. At the top of the society were the big landowners who wielded political power along with other devotees of the Muslim religion. I'm not going to say anything. I'll say less. None of the African societies discussed so far can be said to have thrown up capitalist forms to the point where accum the accumulation of capital became the principal motive force. However, they all had flourishing commercial sectors, money lenders, and strong handicraft industries, which were the features which ultimately gave birth to modern capitalism through evolution and revolution. The Maghreb merchants were quite wealthy. They gained from the energies of the cultivators, cattlemen, and shepherds. They indirectly or directly mobilized the labor in the mines of copper, lead, antimony, and iron. And they appropriated surplus from the skills of the craftsmen, craftsmen making textile, carpets, leather, pottery, and articles of brass and iron. The merchants were a class of accumulators, accumulators, and their dyna dynamism made itself felt not only in the Maghreb, Maghreb, but also in the Sahara and across the Sahara in West Africa. In that way, the development of the Maghreb acted as a factor in the development of what was called the Western Sudan. Fast forward to contemporary times. That one percent, that one percent that we all talk about that apparently is very privileged and we all want to to be like, or at least we were taught that that's, that's, the, that's the standard to pursue in our education, in our skill building, in our working. We want to be a part of the 1%. Right? You have these people online who are telling you uh, uh, they, they, are, they can train you to be a part of that, right? I can train you on how to build wealth. But what essentially that is, is accumulation. That really is what that is. It's not genius. It's not wisdom. It is selfishness, pure selfishness is what the one percenters are. So I'm not going to name names. You all know them. The Western Sudan, to the Arabs, the whole of Africa south of the Sahara was the Bilad as Sudan, the lands of the blacks. The name survives today only in the Republic of Sudan on the Nile. But references to the Western Sudan in early times concern the zone presently occupied by Senegal, Mali, Upper Volta, and Niger, plus parts of Mauritania, Guinea, and Nigeria. The Western Sudanic empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai have become bywords in the struggle to illustrate the achievements of the African past. That is the area to which African nationalists and progressive whites point when they want to prove that Africans too were capable of political, administrative, and military greatness in the epoch before the white men. However, a people's demands at any given time change the kinds of questions to which historians are expected to provide answers. Today, the masses of Africans seek development and total emancipation. Issues that need resolution with regard to Western Sudanic history are those which illu illumine the principles underlying the impressive development of certain states in the heart of Africa. The origins of the empire of Ghana go back to the 5th century AD, but it reached its, its peak between the 9th and 11th centuries. Mali had its prime in the 13th and 14th centuries, and Songhai in the two subsequent centuries. The three were not in exactly the same location, and the ethnic origin of the three ruling classes was different, but they should be regarded as successor states, following essentially the same line of evolution and growth. They have been called trading states so often that it is almost forgotten that the principal activity of the population was agriculture. 
It was a zone in which several species of millet were domesticated along with a species of rice, several other food plants, and at least one type of common. And you all know this um, mining of oil in those areas has taken away all that, right? A lot of that. It was a zone which saw the relatively early introduction of iron in the millennium before the birth of Christ, and iron tools exercised their attendant benefits on agriculture. The open savanna country of the Western Sudan also favored livestock. Some groups such as the Fulani were exclusively pastoralist, but livestock was to be found in varying degrees throughout the huge region. Cattle were the most significant domesticated animals, followed by goats. The rearing of horses, mules, and donkeys was also carried on, which was made possible by wide sissy-free areas. You all know the sessafly or tise tise, like we used to joke in school. To add further variety, the Great Niger River allowed for the rise of specialist fishermen. Population, the indispensable factor of production, could only have reached the density which it did because of increasing food supplies. While handicraft industry and trade sprang primarily from the products of agriculture. Cotton cultivation led to the making of cotton cloth with such a variety of specialization that there was internal trade in particular cotton cloths, such as the unbleached fabric of Futa Jalon and the blue cloth of Njene. Pastoralism provided a variety of products for manufacture, notably cattle hides and goat skins, which went into the making of sandals, leather jackets for military use, leather pouches from amulets, and so on. Horses served as a means of transport to the ruling class and made a major contribution to warfare and the size of the state. For the purpose of interbreeding, some horses were imported from North Africa, where the Arab bloodstock was the finest quality. For pack transport, the donkey was of course better fitted, and the Mosi kingdom of Upper Volta for a long time, for a long time specialized in breeding those pack animals which were associated with long distance trade within the vast region. On the edge of the Sahara, the camel took over, another technological asset introduced from the north. Mining was a sphere in which production was important. Some of the royal clans in the Western Sudan, such as that of the Kante, were specialist blacksmiths. In a period of expansion by warfare, the control over iron supplies and over iron working skills was obviously decisive. Besides, the two most important articles of long-distance trade were salt and gold, both obtained principally by mining. Neither the salt supplies nor the gold supplies were originally within the domains of Ghana, but it took steps to integrate them either by trade or by territorial expansion. Ghana struck north into the Sahara and towards the very end of the 10th century. It captured the town of Au Audagast, from the Berbers, a town useful for the control of the incoming salt in the middle of, de of the desert. Let's just keep in mind as uh, Baba Walter Rodney is talking of these places in the names that he's referring to them, they were not that then, because as you know, these borders are created by, uh, at the Berlin Conference, right? Uh, when the Europeans come together and decide to, uh, which is called the scramble for Africa, divide Africa into borders. So he's naming that to make sense of the story, but yeah, they, they, you're seeing the names that they went by. A town, um, Ghana struck north into the Sahara and towards the very end of the 10th century, it captured the town of Audagast from the Berbers, a town useful for the control of the incoming salt mined in the middle of the desert. Similarly, Mali and Songhai sought to secure control of Tagaza, which was the largest single center of salt mining. Songhai took the prize of Tagaza from the desert Berbers and held it for many years in the face of opposition from Morocco. Another crucial but seldom stressed element in the pattern of production was the ownership of copper mines in the Sahara by both Mali and Songhai. To the south of Ghana lay the important sources of gold on the upper Senegal and it tri its tributary, the Faleme. It is said that Ghana obtained its gold by silent or dumb butter, which was described as follows. 
The merchants beat great drums to summon the local natives who were naked and lived in hole in the ground. From these holes, which were doubtless the pits from which they dug the gold, they refused to emerge in the presence of the foreign merchants. The latter, therefore, used to arrange their trade goods in piles on the river bank and retire out of sight. The local natives then came and placed a heap of gold beside each pile and withdrew. If the merchants were satisfied, they took the gold and retreated, beating their drums to signify that the market was over. The writer of the above lines, E. W. Boville, a supposed European authority on the Western Sudan, Baba Rodney is throwing shade. The writer of the above lines, E. W. Boville, a supposed European authority on the Western Sudan, then goes on to say that silent trade or dumb butter was a feature of the Western Sudan's gold trade throughout all the centuries until modern times. Actually, the only thing dumb about the trade is what he writes about it. The story of dumb butter for gold in West Africa is repeated in several accounts, starting with ancient Greek scripts. It is clearly a rough approximation of the first attempts at exchange of a people con corning into contact with strangers, and it was not a permanent procedure. During the rule of Ghana, the people of the two principal gold fields of Bambuk and Bore were drawn into regular trade re relations with the Western Sudan. Ghana probably, and Mali certainly, exercised political rule over the two regions where the mining and distribution of gold became a very complicated process. During the centuries of Mali's greatness, extensive mining of gold began in the forest of modern Ghana to supply the trans-Saharan gold trade. The existing social systems expanded and strong states emerged to deal with the sale of gold. The merchants who came from the great cities of the Western Sudan had to buy the gold by weight, using a small accurate measurement known as the bender. When the Portuguese arrived at the river Gambia and got a glimpse at how gold was treated on the upper reaches of the river, they marveled at the dexterity shown by the Mandinga merchants. The latter carried very finely balanced scales, inlaid with silver and suspended from cords of twisted silk. The gold dust and nuggets were weighted with brass weights. The expertise of the Mandinga in measuring gold and in other forms of commerce was largely due to the fact that within that ethnic group, there was a core profession of professional traders, commonly referred to as the doulas. They were not very wealthy. Sorry about that, I had to. Oh, my nose, still getting over my cold. Mm. I have to find it. The gold dust and nuggets were weighted with brass weights. The expertise of the Mandinga in measuring gold and in other forms of commerce was largely due to the fact that within that ethnic group, there was a core of professional traders, commonly referred to as the doulas. They were not very wealthy, but were distinguished by their willingness to travel thousands of miles from one end of the Western Sudan to another. They also reached the coast or very near to the coast of Gambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Ivory Coast, and Ghana. The dealers handed a, list of, a long list of African products, salt from the Atlantic coast and the Sahara, polar nuts from the forests of Liberia and Ivory Coast, gold from a Khan country in modern Ghana, leather from Hausa land, dried fish from the coast, cotton cloth from many districts and especially from the central area of the Western Sudan, iron from the Futa Jalon in modern Guinea, share butter from the upper Gambia, and a host of other local articles. In addition, the trade of the Western Sudan involved the circulation of goods originating in North Africa, notably fabrics from Egypt and the Maghreb, and coral beads from Guta on the Mediterranean coast. <clears throat> Therefore, the pattern of Western Sudanic and Trans-Saharan commerce was, integrated, was integrating the resources of a wide area stretching from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic Ocean. 
long distance trade across the Sahara had special characteristics, had special characteristics. Some scholars have spoken of the camel as the ship of the Sahara and the towns which the camel car caravans entered on either side of the desert was called ports. In practice, the Trans-Saharan trade was as great as achievement, an achievement as crossing an ocean. Much more than local trade, it stimulated the famous cities of the region, such as Walata, Timbuktu, Gao, Jene, and it brought in the literate Islamic in the literate Islamic culture. Long distance trade strengthened state power, state power, which meant in effect the power of the lineages who transformed themselves into a permanent aristocracy. However, it is a gross of a simplification of cause and effect to say that it was the Trans-Saharan trade which built the Western Sudanic empires. Ghana, Mali, and Songhai grew out of their environment and out of the efforts of their own populations. And it was only after they had achieved a certain status that their ruling classes could express an interest in long distance trade and could provide the security to permit that trade to flourish. In other words, these parts of Africa had to thrive from within for them to start <clears throat> participating in long distance trade. So they already figured it out from within. It is significant that the Western Sudan never provided any significant capital for the Trans-Saharan trade. The capital came from the merchants of Fez, Tlemcen, and other cities of the Maghreb. And they sent their agents, agents to reside in the Western Sudan. To some extent, it was a colonial relationship because the exchange was unequal in North Africa's favor. However, the gold trade was at least capable of stimulating the development of the productive forces within West Africa, while the accompanying trade in slaves had no such benefits. Ghana, Mali, and Songhai all exported small numbers of slaves, and the empire of Kanem Bornu gave slave exports a much higher priority because it controlled no gold supplies. Yeah, so for those of you who want to, to uh, yeah, the Arabs were practicing slave trade in Africa. Kanem Bonu used its power to raid for captives to the south as far as Adamawa in modern Cameroon. The negative implications of such policies were to be fully brought out in the later centuries when the steady trickle of slaves from a few parts of West Africa across the Sahara was joined by the massive flow of the continent peoples towards destinations named by Europeans. Though falling considerably short of the feudal stage, state formation was more advanced in the Western Sudan than in most other parts of Africa in the period 500 AD to 1500 AD. Apart from Ghana, Mali, Songhai, and Kanem Bonu, there were outstanding kingdoms in Hausaland, in Morsi, in Senegal, in the Fota Jalon Mountains of Guinea, and in the basin of the Benu tributary of the river Niger. The Western Sudanic, Sudanic techniques of political organization and administration spread out to many neighboring regions and influenced the rise of innumerable small states scattered throughout the coastal region from the river Senegal to the Cameroon Mountains. Some specific Sudanic features were discernible in many kingdoms, notably the position of the queen mother in the political structure. The strengths and weaknesses of the Western Sudanic states attest to the point which we had reached on the long road away from communalism with respect to social relations and to the level of production. The state held together several clashing social formations and ethnic groups. In the case of Kanembonu, Pastoralists and cultivators were even able to integrate the camel nomads of the desert. Elsewhere, the Tuareg nomads were kept at bay so that cultivators and other sedentary peoples could live their lives in peace. Men, domestic beasts, and goods were free to move for thousands of miles in security. However, the state had not yet broken down the barriers between different social formations. The state existed as an instrument which collected tribute from the various communities and restrained them from clashing. In periods of weakness, the superstructure of the state almost disappeared and left free scope for divisive political and social tendencies. 
Each successive great state was a further experiment to the deal with a problem of unity, to deal with a problem of unity, sometimes on a conscious level and more often as an unconscious byproduct of the struggle for survival. Under feudalism, the ruling class in the state for the first time tore away the social institutions which prevented the first embryo states from exercising direct action on each subject. This is to say, feudalism brought about a series of direct obligatory ties between the land rulers and the landless subjects. In the Western Sudan, that clear-cut class division had not come into existence. By the time of Mali's preeminence in the 13th and 14th centuries, a small amount of local slavery had come into existence. And by the end of the 15th century, there were both chattel slaves and domestic slaves, comparable to feudal serfs. For instance, in Senegal, the Portuguese traders found that there were elements in the population who worked most days for their masters and a few days per month for themselves, a budding feudalist tendency. Nevertheless, most of the population still had ample access to land through their king and in political terms that meant that the authority of the ruling class was exercised over heads of families and clans rather than over each subject. All right. Although communal egalitarianism was on its way out, communal relations still persisted and had by the fifth century become a break on the development of the Western Sudan. <clears throat> Such surplus as was being produced by the society over and above subsistence needs came out of tribute from the collective communities rather than directly from the producer to the exploiting class. That gave an incentive for maintaining the old social structures, although they were incapable of increasing labor mobilization and specialization to a much greater degree. It was unlikely that there would be a violent social revolution. Under those circumstances, major advances of technology were required to spark off further changes. The degree of economic integ integration had to be enhanced by greater productivity in various areas, allowing for more trade, more specialization in the division of labor, and the possibility of surplus accumulation. But wheeled vehicles and the plow slopped in North Africa, and so too did large-scale irrigation. Remember who invented the wheel, that argument? I want to see where we can take a pause. Um, yeah, we're going to take a pause in, in, after this chapter. No, paragraph is what I meant. Indeed, through the critical absence of large-scale irrigation, the productive base in the Western Sudan actually decreased, for the Sahara was advancing. Ghana had stood on fertile agricultural land, but both Mali and Songhai had their centers further south because the former northern terrain of Ghana was claimed by the Sahara through desiccation. Techniques necessary for the control of this hostile environment and for the increase of agricultural and manufacturing capacity had either to evolve locally or to be brought in from outside. In the next phase of African history, after the coming of the white men, both of those alternatives were virtually ruled out in West Africa. We're going to come back to the inter lacustrine zone is where Baba Rodney will pick up uh, from after our break. So you all go make your tea, go take your break, and to the bathroom, do what you need to do after more than an hour of listening to me read this. We'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs>
Yeah, I I honestly think some brother of mine gave me COVID, but well, I'm glad I'm getting better. Uh, and thank you for those of you wishing me to get better. <clears throat> um, and yes, it's still out there. So be careful, all of you who are gathering. Um, COVID is not gone. All right. Um, the interlacustrine zone. The high level of social evolution in the Western Sudan has been the cause of lengthy debates as to whether the region had achieved feudalism of the European variety or whether it should be classed together with the great Asian empires or whether it created a new and unique category of its own. On the eastern side of the continent, development in the same period was defined definitely slower. For one thing, the people of East Africa acquired iron tools at a, much later, at a much later date than their brothers in the North and West. And secondly, the range of their technology and skills was narrower. However, the 14th century state formation was well underway and the principles of development revealed in the process were, are worth considering. An area of special interest is that of the Great Lakes, lakes of Africa and particularly the zone around the group of lakes which the British thought fit to rename in honor of various members of the British ruling family. Victoria, Albert, Edward, George. Imagine. Listen, you all have to find the video of Milton going to London to, to, to rename River Thames. Uh, I think it was River Thames, whatever it is. And he gives it an African name, just like they did when they came to Africa. He is there. Like he makes a video where he says, I have discovered this river in this place that I am visiting. It's hilarious. Um, in that inter-lacustrine <laughs> zone, several famous states eventually emerged, one of the earliest and largest being that of Bunyoro Kitara. I'm going to say something now, like I, I'm joking about Milton and his video in London, but... <clears throat> One of the first steps in us liberating ourselves, right? We say we are independent African nations, but we're still using Lake Victoria as a name for our lake. You know, that's that's that has to be the first thing that changes. What we call these places, the street names. Like for, for Zambia to have street names in Chinese, Mandarin, whichever Chinese uh, dialect or, or version of Chinese language it is, is a shame. Do you not have a language that you can call your, your streets by? That is your nation. So we, we as Africans must take back the African names. And if not, we will give them new African names based on how or, or, or we used to name our, 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 our rivers and our mountains. What is the powerful uh, thing about this nature, this thing of nature that you see? Does it have high winds? Does it have... Uh, lots of fish does it care for the whole neighborhood does it have poisonous gases let's name them uh with african names and take away the lake victoria the lake albert the lake edward the lake george you're still colonized by your names in that inter lacustrine zone several famous states eventually emerged one the, one of the earliest and largest being that of bunyoro kitara i remember learning about bunyoro kitara in school Bunyoro Kitara comprised in whole or in part the regions which today are called Bunyoro, Ankole, Toro, Karagwe, and Buganda, all of which fall in Uganda, except Karagwe, which is in Tanzania. <clears throat> Tanzania. Historical traditions have been orally preserved by these various peoples who at one time fell within the boundaries of Bunyoro Kitara. And the traditions con concentrate on the ruling dynasty, which is known as the Bachwezi. The Bachwezi were supposedly an immigrant pastoralist group. They introduced long-horned humped long cattle, which later became the major species in the interlacustrine zone. Possession, and someone please check, take a look. Uh, usually when I'm reading, I'll stop to... to to look at words, meanings of words. Please take a look at the meaning for me and put it in the chat of interlacustrine. Interlacustrine. I'll put the word in there so that you can look it up, please. Those of you who already know, you can go ahead. 
uh, I don't know the meaning of this word. It would be helpful if we can figure it out as we continue to read. La Kustrin. I wonder why the area I come from is being called that by Baba Rodney. Inter La Kustrin. That's the word. And you know what? If I have time to type it, I have time to look it up. This is the word we're talking about. So let's look it up quickly. that we can under understand what we're talking about. Just the top Google answer is that uh, of relating to or situated in an area between lakes. Aha, that makes sense. That's why we are called that. Makes sense. All right, there you go. I hope you all got that. It's called that. That area is called that because it's situated between lakes. Possession of these cattle undoubtedly aided them to become a ruling aristocracy in the 14th and 15th centuries. They became a social stratum above the clans which previously existed and which had narrow territorial bases. The period of Bachuesi preeminence is also associated with iron working, the manufacture of bark cloth, the technique of sinking well shafts through rocks, and most strikingly of all, the construction of extensive earthwork systems used apparently both for defense and for enclosing large herds of cattle. We were some mighty people. We still are. We just have to remember that. The largest of the earthworks was at, the, at Bigo, with ditches extending over six and a half miles. The division of labor between pastoralists and cultivators and the nature of their contacts intensified the process of caste formation and class stratification in the interlacrustrian area. The pastoralist Bahima had imposed their rule over the cultivators or Bairu. Social classes grew out of a situation of changing labor relations. The earthworks of Bigo and elsewhere were not built by voluntary family labor. You know, I'm looking at this, I'm sorry. My mind just goes places when I'm reading. Um, and this is the experience you'll have because I'm the one reading, right? We will go to places with my mind. Um, we have been talking about what word do we replace Bantu with? Bantu people are predominantly the, 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 the uh, cultivators, not pastoralists. And Kushites and Kushites were pastoralists. Nilots were uh, the fishermen and all that. And so it appears we had names, Bairu, right? And I need to look up Bairu and Bahima. These are the spellings. Bairu and Bahima. Figure out what they mean, because we might we will go back to Bairu and ditch that Western way of calling us Bantus, which was derogatory and by Bahima, we'll figure out what they mean later. Because I'll go back to calling us Bairu people. Social classes grew out of a situation of changing labor relations. The earthworks of Bigo and elsewhere were not built by voluntary family labor. And some form of coercion must also have been used to get the cultivators to produce a surplus for their new landlords. For instance, the Bachuesi are said to have established a system by which young men were conscripted into the king's service and were maintained by Bairu, who occupied and cultivated land assigned for the support of the army. They also introduced slave artisans and administrators. When administrative officials were appointed at a local level to rule the, on behalf of the aristocrats, that was a first step towards setting up feudal fiefs, as in Ethiopia. For while the question of land grants had not yet entered the picture, it must be borne in mind that inequality in the distribution of cattle meant, in fact, an equal access to the means of production. Much uncertainty surrounds the precise identification of the Bachuesi. It is possible that they were not immigrants. Nevertheless, it is generally held that they were light-complexioned pastoralists coming from the north. Assuming you'll notice that in the East African area, a lot of light-skinned uh, Africans. Um, yeah. Assuming that this was so, it is essential to stress that whatever was achieved in the interlacustrine region in the 14th and 15th centuries was a product of the evolution of African society as a whole and not a transplant from outside. In order to place, including Kiswahili, 
in order to place those in order to place those East African events within the context of universal human achievement, a parallel can be drawn with India. Centuries before the birth of Christ, Northern e India was also the recipient of light-complexioned pastoral immigrants from known, known as Ar Aryans. There was a time when everything in India culture was attributed to the Aryans. But then careful scrutiny, careful scrutiny revealed that the basis of Indian society and culture had been laid by the earlier population known as the Dravidians. Therefore, it is now considered far more sensible to see the achievements of North India as a product of synthesis of combination or of Aryan and Dravidian. Similarly, in East Africa, one needs to seek the elements of synthesis between the new and the old, and that in effect was the path of development in the interlocutorian zone in the 14th and 15th century. I will add because I have the moment to do that now. Kiswahili is not an Arabic language. Let's just make that clear now. And yes, I am going to speak with authority on this. Kiswahili is not an Arabic language. Kiswahili is a language made up from a combination of what they call Bantu languages. The different peoples of East Africa who came together, who were speaking different languages but had very many similarities, put together a language. They called it Kiswahili. When you speak Kiswahili and you hear Akamba speaking, you will hear similar words. When you speak Kiswahili and you hear Bakongo speaking, you will hear similar words. When you speak Kiswahili, you hear Buganda, Luganda, speaking Luganda, you will hear similar words. When you speak Kiswahili and you hear someone from Zimbabwe speaking, speaking um, uh, it's not Kosa. What is it in Zimbabwe? I forget. Lord have mercy. Someone remind me. Shona. You will hear similar languages. When you hear Nkosa, you will hear similarities to Kiswahili. And so when I look at Kiswahili being a native Kiswahili speaker and having spoken it all my life, and I see the little Arabic influence and the tremendous Bantu grounding, I conclude that this is an African language that exists before the Arabs arrive. And what the Arabs do, which is what invading peoples do, is they infect the language, right? Which is why it has some Arabic. Why? For example, yes, you're getting a Kiswahili lesson while we're reading Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. This is the traveling of, of, of being in community with Nduko's mind. When you go to Congo, they speak Kiswahili there too. When you go there, the number 50 is Makumi Matano, five tens. I believe that's the original way Kiswahili is called 50. When you go to the coast side, which is where the Arabs were, which makes sense that the interior has not been infected by the Arabic because the Arabs were in the coastal area. When you go to the coastal areas, Zanzibar, Tanzania, Kenya, that area, Mombasa, 50 is Hamsini, which is that Arabic influence. So logic, not, not even research, logic will tell you that these people who spoke Kiswahili here said 50 Makumi Matano at one point, and because of the Arabic influence, it was changed to Hamsini, but it hasn't been infected in the, in the, in the interior where the Arabs did not get to. So let's stop tripping and calling Kiswahili an Arabic language. Oh, all right, well, now that I've vented, Similarly, in East Africa, one needs to seek the elements of synthesis between the new and the old, and that, in effect, was the path of development in the interlocutorian zone in the 14th and 15th centuries. And I'm not even going to do the research. I'm just going to use logic, and you all take it or don't take it, but I'm going to say, me and the people who end up following this, that Kiswahili is our language. I'm not giving you research to prove how. I gave you the logic. Accept it or don't accept it. Let's move on. As has just been noted, the Batuesi are associated with techniques such as iron working and bark cloth manufacture. It is not at all clearly established that they introduced such techniques for the first time, and it is much more probable that they presided over the elaboration of such skills. Certainly, iron using societies were known in East Africa several centuries before the Batuesi period. At Engaruka, just south of the present Kenya-Tanzania border, 
there are to be found the ruins of a small but impressive Iron Age society, which flourished sometime before the end of the first millennium AD, that is before 1000 AD. In tracing, in terracing irrigation and the construction of walls by the technique known as dry stone building, whereby no time was required to hold the stones together. What I'm going to do with that, Marie Antoinette, is we're going to find what word uh, interlacustrine is in Kiswahili, because that is the language that unites the people in that area, and that is what we will call ourselves, the people between the lands, Watu wa uh, Ziwa. We'll find out how Maziwa. We're going to find out how we're going to call ourselves uh, moving forward instead of Bantu. Um, because we have self-determination, we're embracing self-determination, Africans. We are taking matters into our own hands and determining for ourselves how we are going to be looked at and how we are going to look at ourselves. That is why we're going to do it. And that is why I'm not doing no research. I'm going to tell you logic tells me. And I have heard several African languages and I am seeing more commonalities with Kiswahili in them than in Arabic. So take it or leave it. Um, Engaruka was a concentrated agricultural settlement engaging in terracing, irrigation, and the construction of walls by the technique known as dry stone building whereby no time was required to hold the stones together. In the interlacustrine area itself, my people's area, there had emerged a banana-based agriculture, which was capable of supporting a large sedentary population. I'm telling you, if you see the bananas in Uganda, mm, 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 mm. that was the sort of precondition for moving from communal isolation to statehood. It is significant that orally preserved traditions imply the existence of kingdoms in Bunyoro and Karagwe before the, before the Patrese. State formation was already in an embryo stage when the outsider, outsiders arrived, and the likelihood is that they did not remain outsiders for long. Unlike the Aryans in India, the Patrese did not even impose their own language, but adopted the Bantu speech of the local inhabitants. You all want to tell me Kiswahili is Arabic? Hit the road, like just step. <laughs> this is personal for me. I'm sorry. It is. Um, especially when I see African people rejecting Kiswahili but quickly embracing English and, and, and French. I'm gonna look at you like watcher. Mm. In the interlacustrine area itself, there had been there had emerged a banana-based agriculture which was capable of supporting a large sedentary population. That was the sort of precondition for moving from communal isolation to statehood. It is significant that orally preserved traditions imply the existence of kingdoms in Bunyoro and Karagwe before the Bachwezi. State formation was already in an embryo stage when the outsiders arrived, and the likelihood is that they did not remain outsiders for long. Unlike the Aryans in India, the Bachwezi did not even impose their own language, but adopted the Bantu speech of the local inhabitants. That reflects the dominance of local rather than foreign elements in the synthesis. In any event, the cultural product was African and was part of the pattern of development through localized evolution combined with the interplay of social formations on a continent-wide scale. Let it be known from today, what time is it? 10.39 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday, October 2nd, that Kiswahili is an African language. Take it or leave it. Among the contributions supposedly made by the Bachwezi to the interlacustrine kingdoms was the introduction of region, religion based on the phases of the moon. In all of the situations examined so far, religion played a significant role in promoting the building of the state, leading away from the simple organization of the family community. And by the way, if you want to learn Kiswahili, we have lessons going on. Just reach out to me. You all know I say it every time we have a show how to reach out, reach out to us. Christianity and Islam have been most frequently associated with large-scale building, both inside and outside of Africa. This is to be explained not so much by the actual religious beliefs, but because membership in our powerful universal church gave the ruling class of a young state many advantages. A Christian or Muslim prince had access to a literate culture and a wider world. He dealt with traders and craftsmen professing that religion. 
He used administrators and churchmen who were literate, and he could travel to parts of the world such as Mecca. Above all, the universal religions replaced traditional African ancestral religions in Ethiopia. Sudan, Egypt, and Mag the Maghreb, and progressively in the Western Sudan, because Christianity and Islam were not rooted in any given family community, and therefore could be used to mobilize the many communities that were merging into the state. What they're telling you is that this thing we talk about, right? If we choose Hausa over Yoruba, or if we choose this thing of this community, it will be rejected as a thing that unifies us. Because Christianity and Islam were not that, it was easy for us to embrace it. Now, that's going to take me back again to Kiswahili. If that's the logic and we're trying to return back to our African ways and decolonize our minds, then why not take this language that is not specific to any particular person? Why not take that language and use it as our unifying language instead of English and French? And I'm telling you right now, if you're that African who's going to come talking to me about how Kiswahili is going to, to destroy your your native language, but you're here talking about my name is Aldo, rolling your R's, R's with English or talking French. I'm not even listening to you. There's no grace for you. So learn Kiswahili before you have that argument. Um, and the way to reach me, for those of you who want to take Kiswahili lessons, like we need to stop playing and start acting. We're not going to, we're not going to only learn uh, just to learn and walk away. We're going to learn so that we can take action. And Baba Rodney says that, like I said before, in the groundings, right? He's telling us to learn as intellectuals, but now to take action and to unite with the masses so that we can take action with the knowledge from us and from them united to build solutions. Um, if you want to reach me, you can reach me on Instagram at nduko9127, at nduko9127, my name, 9127, if you're interested in Kiswahili, learning Kiswahili. Um, and don't come at us saying you're interested and you don't commit to what needs to be done so that you can learn. So just saying, if you're not going to commit, just don't, don't contact me. Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe, one of the great constructions in brick dated around the 14th century is commonly referred to as temple and is felt to have served religious purposes. Even from the scanty evidence, it is clear that the religious aspect of social development was of the greatest importance in serving to cement ties, cement ties between individuals in that emergent African society. For instance, the ruling class in the 15th century empire of Mutapa in Zimbabwe were pastoralists and their religious ritual included objects that were symbolic of cattle, as was found in the interlacustrine kingdoms such as Bunyoro and Karagwe. I'm going to take off my warrior hat for a minute <laughs> and put on my nurturing motherly heart and say, yes, I am I am saying to you, don't reach out to me if you're not serious about what, what is required to learn Kiswahili. But what is required is not that difficult. What is required is doing the assignments. We don't have a grading system. We're learning from community. We have a group and a, and a location where we practice daily how to speak. So posting your videos on your speaking, posting words, communication in Kiswahili. So that's what's required daily. And I'm not going to be following you up if you don't do it in a week, but just get it done so that you are familiarizing yourself with the language. Uh, that's the whole idea about learning language. It's not memorizing. It's becoming familiar with the language and the culture. So in order to become familiar with anything, you have to be experiencing it on a regular basis. So if you want to do that, reach out to me at nduku9127 on Instagram, and I'll give you the information you need to get access to the classes, all right? We started in August, they are recorded. You can go back to the recordings and learn and catch up with us because we will have a break between the, the beginning and intermediary uh, classes. One can guess that the rituals also symbolized the dominance of the cattle owners, just as they also paid respect to pre pre-existing ideas or the cultivators in order to effect a stable synthesis. The details of the picture are not available in the present stage of knowledge, but what is required is that any discussion of African religion must seek to present it 
in a mobile evolutionary manner and to relate it to changing socioeconomic forms and institutions. That task being beyond the confines of the present study, it is proposed to examine Zimbabwe as yet another region where the productive base and the political superstructure can be ascertained to have developed appreciably in the last few centuries before Africa was drawn into contact with Europe. Within the southernmost section of the continent, the area in which striking achievements were registered by the 15th century was that between the rivers Zambezi and Limpopo, covering the territories that were later to be called Mozambique and Rhodesia. Iron using and state building peoples were active there from early in the first millennium AD, and eventually there emerged in the 15th century the empire which Europeans called Monomotapa. The term Zimbabwe is being used here to designate the Zambezi Limpopo cultures and in the few centuries preceding the European arrival because it was from the 11th to the 14th century that there flourished the societies whose most characteristic feature was the building of large stone palaces known collectively as Zimbabwe. Much has been written about the buildings which distinguish the Zimbabwe culture. They are a direct response to the environment of granite rocks. Is Zimbabwe where you can find like a the the like a great wall? I forget my memory again. They are a direct response to the environment of granite rocks, being being built upon granite hills and of and of flaked granite. I think it is Zimbabwe. The most famous site of surviving stone ruins is that of the Great Zimbabwe, north of the River Sabi. One of the principal structures at Great Zimbabwe was some 300 feet long and 200 feet broad. Yes, with the walls being 30 feet high and 20 feet thick. It is Zimbabwe. At least one of them. The technique of laying the bricks one on the other without time to act as a cement was the same style noted in the description of Engaruka in northern Tanzania. So... We honor the Chinese for their great wall, right? Kudos, great work. But let's not forget that we have something similar in Africa and we're capable of it in Africa because it's sitting there, standing there as evidence where you can see with your left and your right eye that Africans built that. It was in fact a peculiar aspect of material culture in Africa being widely found in Ethiopia and the Sudan. Like I said, I think it's in more than one place in Africa. The style of the encircling brick walls at Great Zimbabwe and other sites was also characteristically African in that it was an elaboration of the mud enclosures or kraals of many Bantu-speaking people. One European archaeologist is reported to have said that there was as much labor expanded in Zimbabwe as on the pyramids in Egypt. Mm -hmm. That is surely an overstatement. For the pyramids were raised through an incredible amount of slave, la slave labor, which could not possibly have been at the disposal of the rural, ru rulers in Zimbabwe. If you all miss the humor that Baba Rodney has as he speaks of this serious subject, you all are missing out. He clearly, every now and then he throws shade. He has like sarcasm. He just is hilarious. At least I find him hilarious. This is surely an overstatement for the pyramids were raised through an incredible amount of slave labor, which could not possibly have been at the disposal of the rulers in Zimbabwe. However, it is definitely necessary to reflect on the amount of labor which would have been required to construct the buildings within the Zimbabwe region up until the 15th century. The workers may well, may well have been from particular ethnic groups who were subjugated by other ethnic groups but in the process of subjugation, they were acquiring the character of a social class whose labor was being exploited. Nor was it sheer manual labor. Skill, creativity, and artistry went into the construction of the walls, especially with regard to the decorations, the inner recesses, and the doors. I cannot, well, I can wait, but I look forward to seeing these walls for myself with my left eye and my right eye. That's a phrase I have taken from a friend who keeps telling me that he will believe only when he sees with his left eye and his right eye, which is hilarious to me. So I've taken that as well. 
When Cecil Rhodes sent in his agents to rob and steal in Zimbabwe, they and other Europeans marveled at the surviving ruins of the Zimbabwe culture and automatically assumed that it had been built by white people. And listen, white oppressors be trifling sometimes, seriously. Even today, there is still a tendency to consider their achievements with a sense of wonder rather than with a calm acceptance that it was perfectly logical out outgrowth of human social development within Africa. Now, I don't even need you to have um, calm acceptance. I just wanted to hit you in your face. Like, poor. Kupigwa butwa chakari, tuf. Africans build that. Take it or leave it. We're taking it. The sense of reality... Mm, made me lose where I was. Even today, there is still a tendency to consider the achievements with a sense of wonder rather than with a calm acceptance. Baba Rodney, let's not even give him that grace. Accept it or not. That it was a perfectly logical outgrowth of human social development within Africa as part of the universal process by which man's labor opened up new horizons. The sense of reality can only be restored by making it clear that the architecture rested on a foundation of advanced agriculture and mining, which had come into existence over centuries of evolution. Europeans, today you will be told, for those of you who land on this page and listen to this, that we Africans had skill before you came to Africa. You did not civilize us. We had skill. Zimbabwe was a zone of mixed farming, with cattle being very important since the area is free from sassafras, Irrigration and terracing reached considerable proportions. There was no single darn or aqueduct comparable to those in Asia or ancient Rome, but countless small streams were diverted and made to flow around hills in a manner that indicated an awareness of the scientific principles governing the motion of water. I think this is coming back. I've seen the nice vegetables that are being posted online growing in Zimbabwe now that they have their land back from the white invaders. Well, most of it. There are still some white invaders. I've seen them on LinkedIn talking about it's their land. In effect, the people of Zimbabwe had produced hydrologi hydrologists through their understanding of the material environment. And I know you might consider me as crass uh, or... These are the terms that have been given to me. I digress again. I'm pausing. Uh, what's it? I was told my way of talking is aggressive, abrasive, right? Uh, I was told um, I have no tact. I'm tactless because I am one who will go to LinkedIn and remind a white Zimbabwean who is a descendant of invaders who participated in Rhodesian walls, wars and has that as their profile, that they are an oppressor, especially if they're denying that ancestry. You are, you simply are. That is not your land. I'm sorry. It was stolen by your grandpa or your great grandpa or your great great grandpa. And it belongs to the people there who you're man marginalizing. So you best take a humble note or you will be reminded because we are awakening. And I am very much okay with the white people who are settled on land that they stole on Africa, in Africa, being kicked off of it. It's not theirs. I don't care how much money now they have invested in it, if they are investing any money. It's not your land. You stole it. We're taking it back. It's just as simple as that. I'm not apologizing. I'm not going to be kind about it. I'm not going to feel sorry for anyone. It's just as simple as that. Y'all know we wouldn't be given the same courtesy in their lands. I don't know why you are all trying to accommodate them, Africans. I had to argue with a black man about that. Anyway, I digress. In effect, the people of Zimbabwe had produced hydrologists through their understanding of the material environment. On the mining side, it is equally striking that the African peoples in the zone in question had produced pr prospectors and geologists who had a clear idea of where to look for gold and copper in the subsoil. When the European colonialists arrived in the 19th century, they found that virtually all the gold bearing and copper bearing strata had been mined previously by Africans. Though, of course, not on the same scale as Europeans were to achieve with drilling equipment. Among the Zimbabwe people, there also arose craftsmen who worked the gold into ornaments with tremendous skill 
and lightness of touch. In hindsight, as I think of it now, this sentence here, I'm going to pause real quick just to address that, right? When the European colonialists arrived in the 19th century, they found that virtually all the gold bearing and copper bearing strata had been mined previously by Africans. Though, of course, not on the same scale as Europeans were to achieve with drilling equipment. Given the harm to the environment that the drilling equipment has had, and given that we don't need the excess that the drilling equipment provides, I'm okay with us as Africans continuing with the way we were doing things so that we can preserve our environment. And maybe that is the reason why we never did what they did, right? The harm it causes to drill into the earth constantly, drilling and taking out of it. Maybe it's okay that we continued the way we were doing things and maybe it's okay we go back to that so that we can preserve our environment so that it in return can care for us, Ubuntu. Among the Zimbabwe people, there also arose craftsmen who worked the gold into ornaments with tremendous skill and lightness of touch. Ah, Lord have mercy. I keep just, I can't. This thing, I have heard an African, because a lot of us were colonized mentally, talking about they can teach you how to create value in yourself as an Africa, right? An African. Here we are being told that Zimbabwean people arose as craftsmen who worked the gold into ornaments with tremendous skill and lightness of touch. Yet colonialists come and decide that they're going to not put value in that, not even educate those people anymore, but take value to the white woman in wherever it is they come from or the white man wherever it is they come from. And that's where they're going to place value on the end product of gold or, or diamonds. As if the pre listen, if you're a black person who comes out sounding like a colonialist, I have to diagnose you. I have to tell you you sound like a colonialist so that you can know what you're sick with and so that you can find medication for it so that you stop sounding like a colonialist and so that you can decolonize your mind. I got to. It's a duty. If I don't tell you, I am failing. So don't take it personally. Just continue to decolonize your mind like I did because someone told me in classes that I was taking with him, and I was mentally colonized. It hurt at first, but instead of dwelling in my feelings, I did the work to decolonize my mind. The presence of gold in particular was a stimulus to external trade, and in turn, it was external demand which did most to accelerate mining. And I'm going in this moment to thank uh, <laughs> Dr. Kimathika for the work he did to help me decolonize my mind and to put me on this journey where I am continuing to decolonize mine and many others' uh, minds. Thank you for being brutally honest. In the first millennium AD, there was a gold-using aristocracy at Ingombe Hede, just north of the Zambezi. Presumably, they got their supplies from gold mines farther south. However, Gold is required in large quantities only in a society which produces a very large economic surplus and can afford to transform part of that surplus into gold for prestige purposes, as in India, or into coinage and money to promote capitalism, as in West Europe, Western Europe. The pre-feudal African societies did not have such a surplus, nor the social relations which made it necessary for gold to circulate a great deal internally. Hence, it was the presence of Arab traders as far south as Sofala in the Mozambique Channel, which spurred Zimbabwe to mine more gold for export, just about the same time in the 11th century when stone building was beginning. The implication is that a number of factors coincided, namely the intensification of class stratification, of state consolidation, of production and building techniques, and of trade. We did not need to produce that much gold anyway, so we didn't need drilling. It is the extraction of it from Africa that caused us to need it. These people coming from elsewhere to say they want some. Several different ethnic groups contributed to Zimbabwean society. The earliest populations of the region were the Bushmen. The Khoisan type of, he does that in, in, in quotes, Bushmen. I should have mentioned that. He's not accepting the term. Baberoni is not. 
and Khoisan type of hunters who today are found only in small numbers in Southern Africa. They were incorporated into the physical stock of newcomers from further north speaking Bantu languages. And um, in fact, they made their contribution to the Bantu languages of the area. I'm not, I'm not yet calling um, those languages, what was the word Baba Rodney was calling it? Interlock, inter, we have it here in the chat. I'm not calling it that yet because Bantu languages extend beyond the, the land between the lakes. Um, so interlacustrine, right? I'm not calling it interlacustrine languages yet because they extend all the way to the south. Among the Bantu speaking leader, speak, speakers, there were also several different groups coming into their own at different times. The material evidence which has been revealed by archaeologists shows various pottery styles, contrasting burial positions and different horn structures among skeletons. Other material artifacts shown that over, show that over the centuries, many societies occupied the region of Zimbabwe. Much of the interpenetration of one group by another was done peacefully, although at the same time, the very existence of the fortified hilltops and stone defenses shows that the largest states were engaged in military struggles for survival and preeminence. Furthermore, some ethnic groups must have been permanently relegated to inferior status so as to provide the labor for agriculture, building, and mining. Other clans specialized in pastoralism, warfare, and the control of religious apparatus such as divination, divination, and rainmaking. It is believed that the inhabitants of Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe in the 11th to the 14th centuries were Sotho speaking. But by the time the Portuguese arrived, a Shona speaking dynasty had taken control of most of the region. That was the Rosewi clan, which set up the state of Mutapa between the Zambezi and the Limpopo. The ruler was known as the Mwene Mutapa. Mwene, see? There we go again with Bantu languages being similar. Mwene is owner, and I believe that's what this means, right? The state is Mutapa, Mwene Mutapa, the owner of the... <laughs> Babaroni will explain it. But now, just from my language, in Kikamba, Mwene is owner. In Kiswahili, Mwenyewe is owner. So the similarities in the Bantu languages, which apparently meant the great lord of Mutapa to his own followers, but was held to mean the great pillager. I guess that ends up being a nickname given what you're doing by peoples whom he conquered and wielded together into a single empire. The first individual to hold the title Mwene Mutapa ruled from about 1415 to 1450, but the dynasty had already been growing prominent before that date. I'm gonna tell you right now that Mwene is owner. I know as owner, you can end up being great Lord, but given, the meaning in Kikamba, the meaning in Kiswahili, it's owner of the Mutapa. The capital was at first sighted at Great Zimbabwe and later, later moved north. What was important was that the Mwene Mutapa appointed governors to rule over various localities outside the capital in a manner comparable to that of the Western Sudanic empires or the interlacustrine Batwezi states. The Rosary Lords of Mutapa did most to encourage production for export trade, notably in gold, ivory, and copper. Arab merchants came to reside in the kingdom and the Zimbabwe region became involved in the network of Indian Ocean commerce, which linked them with India, Indonesia, and China. So you tell me, in a time where the slave trade is going on in West Africa and a coastal commerce is building in um east africa and remember the origin of the uh transatlantic slave trade is starting with the arabs right and the arabs are the same people coming to east africa you all think when they go back home they don't tell each other yo i found a place in east africa too we can get people from and the fact that they don't take those people and enslave them wherever they do yeah logic again logic and facts right critical analysis they exacted tribute from the various communities in their kingdoms. <sighs> Once, one of the principal achievements of the Rosary Lords of Mutapa was to organize a single system of production and trade. 
They exacted tribute from the various communities in their kingdoms, which was both a sign of sovereignty and a form of trade because the movement of goods was stimulated. There is no doubt that the foreign trade strengthened the Mutapa state, but above all, it strengthened the ruling strata, which had a monopoly over that aspect of economic activity. In comparison with other African elites at that time, the Roswe of Zimbabwe still had a long way to go. They were not in the same category as the Amharic nobility of Ethiopia or the Arab Berber feudal lord of the Maghreb. They did imbibe a few influences from outside, but they did not travel as did the rulers of Mali and Songhai who made the pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, Lord, why am I forgetting his name? I'll remember it. Mm, I'll remember it. You all know who I'm trying to remember. Uh, pilgrimage from Mar Mali to Mecca. Mm. I'll remember. I had it before too. Their dress was still mainly animal skins and such cloths as they utilized were recent imports from the Arab traders rather than the product of the evolution of their own skills in that field. In that respect, Zimbabwe also trailed behind other early African states such as Oyo in Yoruba land, Benin in the same area, and the 14th century empire of Congo, which Europeans referred to as the greatest state in West Africa at the time of their arrival. Yes, thank you, Jay. Lord of mercy. It was still bothering me. Mansa Musa. Thank you. It has been considered necessary for the purposes of illustration. Thank you, Kemani. Uh, <laughs> to consider, I kept like reading and thinking, I know his name and you have it in your head, but it's not coming out anyway. Mansa Musa, yes, he took that pilgrimage with gold um, through and went to Mecca. And I kind of have beef with Mansa Musa because he's the one who shows them that we have gold and brings them. But anyway, I'll forgive Mansa Musa. He, he did good. Nor should it be forgotten that there were innumerable village communities imagined to become states that were small in size, but were sometimes sharply stratified internally and displayed an impressive level of material advance. Those described above should be sufficient to establish that. Africa is the 15th century, in the 15th century, was not just a jumble of different tribes. There was a pattern and there was historical movement. Societies such as a feudal, as feudal Ethiopia and Egypt were at the farthest point of the process of evolutionary development. Zimbabwe as the Bachwezi and the Bachwezi states were also clearly on the ascendant away from communalism, but at a lower level than the feudal states and a few others that were not yet feudal, such as those in the Western Sudan. We're going to get to the conclusion of the chapter. But before we do, I'm going to say, as I speak of Mansa Musa and me having beef with him, that I am learning through the lessons of recent years, recent months, that we as Africans need to stop expecting perfections of our leader, right? Our leaders. We need to stop expecting perfection of each other. The thing that I'm using now to judge, um, and not necessarily who's good, who's bad, but who is going to be beneficial to the well-being of Africans and who is going to be detrimental, is yes, you did bad, but what are you doing today to do good? What are you doing to, do, to repair the bad that you did, right? If you continue to do bad, see ya, bye-bye, you're an oppressor in my book. But if you realize the bad that you did and you start doing good to repair the bad, I'm good with that. Let's move on. And I'm not expecting perfection of my fellow human beings because I'm not perfect. And it's something that I'm learning as I get older, even as I speak the way I do, where it sounds like I'm being... What have I been told, called? Um, I forget the terms sometimes because they are so irrelevant. It's not even funny. Anyway, it is necessary for some of us to speak the way I speak because the only way that we will decolonize our minds is to have a blunt realization of what's going on. This uh, gentle touching and gentle massaging of people, people get too comfortable and they want to 
coexist with the things that are decolonizing their mind instead of just reading themselves of it. So it is you are actually doing a good thing when you bluntly tell people they are colonized mentally and this is what they can do to decolonize their minds. But for the sake of some people's peace, I just don't hang out with them because they're very, very uncomfortable when I tell them they're colonized mentally. And, and that's okay. But for those who actually want solutions, we all, and I'm, I'm glad, I, I will be happy if you tell me what I'm still doing that is colonized that I'm not aware of, that I need to, to shave off so that I can continue to walk towards the path to African liberation without bringing along, as Dr. Wilson calls it, Amos Wilson calls it, the demon, that we are possessed with demons. I need, I need that exorcism, as he says, full exorcism. I don't want the, some segments or fragments of the demon remaining in me. Those of you who've listened to Dr. Wilson know what I'm talking about. Conclusion. In introdu introducing the concept of development, attention was drawn to the fact that the slow, imperceptible expansion in social productive capacity ultimately amounted to a qualitative difference with the arrival at the new stage sometimes being announced by social violence. It can be said that most African societies had not reached a new stage that was markedly different from communalism and hence the use of, in this study, of the cautious term transitional. And I'm going to invite you all to put questions in the chat if you have questions, because we can have a short discussion once we mean, finish the chapter in uh, two more pages left. So if you have questions, if you have observations on what we just read, there's a lot we, we took in in that chapter, a lot of history, but it's necessary to build a background so that he can make his case later, Baba Rodney can make his case, right? He said, we have to go back. Those four questions that he said, you must, uh, and I'll quickly go back to them when we finish reading. I'll go back to them. He said, we must look at them in order to, to have a correct analysis of what is wrong and what must be done. It can also, uh, that's me paraphrasing. It can also be noted that nowhere had there been any internal social revolutions. The latter have taken place in European and world history only where class consciousness led to the massive intervention of people's wills within the otherwise involuntary socioeconomic process. Such observations helped to situ situate African development up to the 15th century at a level that was below mature, class-ridden feudalism. It should also be reiterated that slavery is a mode of production, as a mode of production was not present in any African society. Although some slaves were to be found where the decomposition of communal equality had gone furthest. This is an outstanding feature illustrating the, the autonomy of the African path within the broader framework of universal advance. One of the paradoxes in studying this early period of African history is that it cannot be fully comprehended without first deepening our knowledge of the world at large. And yet, the true picture of the complexities of the development of man and society can only be drawn after intensive study of the long neglected African continent. There is no escaping the use of comparisons as an aid to clarity. And indeed, the parallels have been narrowly restricted to Europe, even though they could also be provided by examples from Asian history. Therein lies the cultural imperialism which makes it easier for the European educated African to recall names like the French Capetians and the Prussian Hohenzollerns rather than the Vietnamese dynasties of Aid and Tran, for the latter are either unknown to him or would be considered unimportant if known or might even be judged too difficult to pronounce. Man, the colonized African mind, y'all. Several historians of Africa have pointed out that after surveying the developed areas of the continent in the 15th century and those within Europe at the same time, the difference between the two was in no way to Africa's discredit. Indeed, the first Europeans to reach West and East Africa by the sea were the ones who indicated that in most respects, African development was comparable to that which they knew. To take but one example, when the Dutch visited the city of Benin, they described it as thus. 
The town seems to be very great. When you enter into it, you go into a great broad street, not paved, which seems to be seven or eight times broader than the Worms, Wormers Street in Amsterdam. Yo, there was a street in Benin that was bigger than one in Amsterdam. These white people are admitting that. The King's Palace is a collection of buildings which occupy as much space as the town of Harlem and which is enclosed with walls. They don't have bias, right? Sorry, I am interrupting. They don't have bias yet. So they can, they're, they're just saying what they're seeing. They're writing what they're seeing. They don't have bias. Yet. What type of bias? They don't need yet to justify the enslavement and subjugation of black people to produce trade and, and production and, and industrialization. So they have no bias. They're just encountering them and stating what they see. So there's no need to change the narrative yet. And which enclosed with walls? is enclosed with walls. There are numerous apartments from for the princes, ministers, and fine galleries, most of which are as big as those on the exchange at Amsterdam. They are supported by wooden pillars and cased with copper, where their victories are depicted and which are carefully kept very clean. Man. The town is composed of 30 main streets, very straight and 120 feet wide, apart from an infinity of small intersecting streets. The houses are close to one another, arranged in good order. These people are in no way inferior to the Dutch as regardless clean, cle as regards cleanliness. Y'all, <laughs> going back to the showering thing. These people are in no way inferior to the Dutch as regards cleanliness. They wash and scrub their houses so well that they are polished and shining like a looking glass. Straight from the invader's mouth before he had reason to have bias so that he could create a false narrative to justify his actions. Yet, it would be self-delusion to imagine that all things were exactly equal in Benin and in Holland. European society was already more aggressive, more expansionist, and more dynamic in producing new forms. The dynamism within Europe was contained within the merchant and manufacturing class. In the galleries of the exchange at Amsterdam, sat Dutch burgers or burgers, the ancestors of the modern bourgeoisie of industry and finance. This class in 15th century Europe was able to push the feudal landowners forward or, in, or aside. They began to discard conservatism and to create the intellectual climate in which change was seen as desirable. A spirit of innovation arose in technology and transformation of the mode of production was quickened. When Europe and Africa established close relations through trade, there, were th there was therefore already a slight edge in Europe's favor. favor, an edge representing the difference between a fledging capitalist, so capitalist society and one that was still emerging from communalism. Communalism. That is chapter two. Baba Rodney gave us a good um, background of the cultures, the main cultures, the, the more known cultures of Africa. He's building this so that he can come and, and give us, uh, build his case of how Europe underdevelops Africa. Next week, same time, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and if you'd rather me start at nine, let me know. Uh, we can do that. If nine is a better time to start, let me know. Uh, just put it in the chat, send it to us on the email. Again, you can reach me uh, on Instagram, nduku9127. You can let me know if 9 o'clock in general. If I see more 9 o'clock, then we'll start at 9. But it's 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for now. And they are recorded. So if you miss the 8 o'clock start time, you can go back and listen to the beginning uh, of the readings. Please share, share, share. Why? Because we want this message to read as to reach as many masses as possible. Baba Rodney, when he wrote this, wanted that to happen for this message because he was working on decolonizing our minds, uh, wants us to be aware so that we can be more equipped to figure out solutions. So next week we'll be reading Africa's contribution to European capitalist development, the pre-colonial period. And I'm looking forward to the shade in there and all the lessons that we're going to learn. Uh, Baba Rodney in chapter two tells us, I want us to go away with this. Um, um, <clears throat> if we have no questions, you're welcome. It is my pleasure. I am here to serve. Like I said, I was mentally colonized. I did some stuff that I am, I'm not even going to say I'm ashamed of because shame does not serve me. 
but that were not helpful to African people and were actually harmful. And so what do I do now that I know that the things I did were not helpful and were harmful? And now that I know there's a better way, I change action. So for me, this is part of my penance to come and read daily and do what Baba Rodney uh, wanted done. If you have, for those of you in Africa, share, one way you can share, and I know this because uh, our hometown is a small town, those kiosks, uh, those places you go, those little restaurants where you go, you, you have a relationship with them, the youth gather, uh, get a projector, get a white wall with a projector. I know you all have projectors. Those schools in African towns, uh, Precious Blood uh, High School in Kilungu, I'm looking at you, you're my former uh, high school, invite the community to come and see these videos so that they can learn. And I know you are a Catholic school, so you're very much colonized, but in case there's a teacher there that's decolonizing their minds, or in case the administration at Precious Blood Girls High School in Kilungu is decolonizing their minds, please open up those halls that we had with the nice white walls. And I know you have projectors because I went to school there and invite the community to come and watch these sessions. Let's educate the African masses so that we can be liberated. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> Baba Rodney tells us to set the record straight. This is what I want us to take home with us today after all that and so that you can understand why he wrote that chapter and why he's saying what he's saying this is what he says and i thank you all for joining us it is my pleasure to do this work i will continue to do much more with all the authors and all the copyright owners who allow me to to get the different messages out uh, to the masses to set the record straight four operations are required one, reconstruction of the nature of development in Africa before the coming of Europeans. Two, reconstruction of the nature of development which took place in Europe before expansion abroad. Three, analysis of Africa's contribution to Europe's present developed state. Four, Analysis of Europe's contribution to Africa's present underdeveloped state. And that's what Baba Rodney, he answers that second one, right? Does throughout the chapter. Um, sit with that, look at it, start doing the work that needs to be done so that we can find a solution. By reconstruction, he means going back, right? You have been miseducated, so you're going to reconstruct what your mind is absorbing, the knowledge in your, in your, in your, in your mind. Um, and, and see what happened. What was the nature of development in Africa before the Europeans came in? What was the nature of development in the Europe before they expanded to Africa? What was the nature of Africa's contribution to Europe's present developed state? And what was the nature of Europe's contribution to Africa's current underdeveloped state or what they call, because he has it all in quotes, underdeveloped state. All right, I wish you all well. Thank you all for joining me and being here with me, um, with us. We, we are in community. We're going again to be on chapter three next week. Uh, yes, share, 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 and get the information to the masses. My responsibility, my duty, because I have the platform, we have the platform, and because I have the book, is to read. Your responsibility is to share. So if you're attending today, the 14 people who attended, share with at least 10 people today who don't have access to this book or who don't have access to this knowledge or who you know but you're not willing to tell that they are colonized. Tell them by sending them the video. Have a nice day. Sikunjama. Kwaherini.